Okay, guys, I am going to get started. We still have some more people that are probably going to uh, be showing up and right on cue. I've got two more coming in, so I'm going to go click them in. And that might happen for the first couple minutes here. But my name is Eric, and I am with, obviously, Nuttles Sewing Center. I am one of the owners of Nuttles, along with my mother and father and my beautiful wife. So I've been with uh, full time with Nuttles for 25 years. So fresh out of college, I came in to work with Nuttles for Norm Nuttle, who is was my business, my, my mother's business partner. Um, you know, 20 plus years ago, she she ended up buying him out. But prior to the buyout, I came and worked for him, and that's how I got into the business. Uh, since then, I now have brothers, two brothers in the business. I have a sister who's in the business, a niece. So it's definitely a a real family affair. Makes Family vacations a little bit tricky, but um, the way that this class is designed in, uh, we haven't done this before with the handy quilter. So I'm super excited to do this because uh, one, I think it's really hard sometimes to have a product like a big long arm machine uh, and just do all lecture demo, meaning where you're just sitting in a big, you know, uh, in chairs and a U shape around me as I do my thing. So I think it's really important to be able to, at times, be able to go up and uh, test some of those things out on your own. Look at your own frame. So hopefully you guys are in a, in a place, because that's the way this was designed. Hopefully you are in a place to where you can have access to your equipment as well. Because at some point, you're going to want to be the driver and not just the passenger on this ride. So that's really kind of where we're at and what we're hoping for. Um, everybody is coming in on mute but you can unmute at any time. Just feel free to unmute. The only thing I ask is, you know, after you're done with your question or whatnot, whatnot, you might just mute. That way it keeps everything rolling a little bit smooth so we don't get too much confusion or background noise going as uh, the class continues. This is being recorded. Um, how that recording turns out is always kind of a mystery. We'll find out and see how it goes, but usually it turns out really well. And once that recording is done, uh, it gives me a couple days to go in and get that kind of edited down and uh, distributed. So I will send the recordings out, a link for the recording, so you guys will have them through like email and whatnot. Uh, my goal is hopefully the same as your goal, and sometimes they don't align, and I apologize for that, but I'll tell you what my goals are, and that way we have the right expectation, because I think expectations are very, very important to have a good class. And so my expectations, you guys, are for you to feel comfortable um, really getting that first, second, third, fourth, could be your 15th quilt on, whatever it is, I want you to feel more confident in that. I want you to feel really comfortable in going to your machine and maybe doing some things um, a different way that might work out a little bit better for you. Uh, you can always teach me some th new things. I learn something new every time I teach. And I've always said this, so whenever somebody says, you know, how do you learn all these things? Um, I take a lot of classes myself. But if you really want to learn, um, the best way is to, is to teach. I, I find that every time I've had to teach something, um, my learning accelerates massively. And it can be something I've taught for 10 years. But every time I prep for the class, every time I sit down and get ready, um, I, I, I learn something new every single time. So um, teaching is always, uh, for me, it's the best way to learn and if that's something you're interested in, we, we're always looking for educators to do different things for us here as well. Uh, even if it's just showing your friend how to do something, I think teaching is, is a pretty big, big uh, way to, to move up as far as your skill level. So the class is designed, again, to be interactive. And sometimes it works out well, and sometimes it doesn't. It really just depends on you guys and, and the questions that you have. If you don't have any, the class will still go on. It'll still move, and we'll do our thing. Um, certain questions will come up that we might have to say, well, maybe we'll have to get on a separate uh, call to look that over. So one thing that I have really enjoyed, there's not a lot of things coming out of the pandemic that I've really enjoyed, but one of them is uh, getting used to not just on our ends, all the new technology, but on your end, you guys are getting a lot more comfortable. You know, three years ago, this class probably would not have been possible. Uh, just, just the logistics of getting people even into the class, um, signed up, making sure that everybody has the logins. And, you know, we had even a few people that didn't get that. And, and, and I see some of you did 
get our second email, we made another phone call. So anyone that wasn't able to respond to that first email, we did make phone calls to try and get you in. And I hope that we got everybody in that wanted to be here. So with that said, um, your mic is again on mute. You can unmute it anytime, you can mute it uh, as we go. But we're going to be working primarily with two different products. Um, the, this is the Handy Quilter Forte. It is a 24 inch machine. Um, some of you may have the Amara. The Amara is our number one selling machine. So I'm pretty sure we've got several of you that are, that are in here with the Amara. The Amara and the Forte are the exact same with the difference, uh, one of the differences being the size. So the Amara is a 20 inch, what they call open arm. That's on the inside of the machine. That angle's a little tricky to see it, but uh, 20 inch versus 24. And then the frame, the, the Forte comes on a gallery two frame. That's what I'm going to be working with. And I'll be talking about some of the features of this frame. And then we'll have um, the, the uh, Amara is on a studio two frame. So that one's gonna be a little bit different as far as its features, but we go over and talk about loading the frame and all of those different things. And then the next machine, so we will be working on a Forte, but again, everybody that has an Amara, this Forte is, is just take really good notes on what we're talking about because it's the same as yours, just difference in the frame and um, the size of the machine. Then we also have our Moxie. So the Moxie is another machine that plenty of you have. And it's a whole different deal as far as the frame. It's it's uh, price point is different, and it's 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 really opened the door. I think you guys, which I've been excited about uh, for quilters. You know, people that were not interested in spending you know the kind of money that it costed to get into a long arm have found their way into a long arm through the Moxie. So we're really excited to have that added to the class. What you guys are going to see throughout this class is you're gonna see a lot of techniques. So you're gonna see ways to load the frame. I think that's important. So we're gonna definitely start there. We're gonna talk about tensions. We're gonna talk about needles. We're gonna talk about threads. Um, all of the things that you need to know before you really start grabbing those handles and moving that machine around, okay? So we've gotta have a good foundation. I think that's really, really important. It's kind of like if you were building a, a home today, you wouldn't want to start off with a really bad foundation. You really need to start with the foundation first and build our way up. So that's the way that we're going to work into this. We're going to start with the bobbin and we're going to talk about the bobbin because that is, again, the foundation of um, as far as foundation with your threads, locking and tension and so forth. So we'll go in. We're going to talk about the bobbin, how to wind it, how to get it squared away that uh, with tensions correctly. And then what we'll do is we'll kind of move from there. We'll move into threading of the machine work our way through that, then we'll go into loading. Um, and that usually, and then also, you know, some maintenance. Usually that takes us first through this first uh, class. And so we'll see how it goes through Zoom. So if some of you that joined a little bit later or uh, right when we were starting, this is our first Zoom class with Handy Quilter. Um, really important to maybe say with Handy Quilter because I've been doing Zoom classes for the last couple of years now successfully. And I would say, you know, my definition of success is how many times or how many questions do we find the consumer comes back with after taking these classes? And what kind of questions are they? I expect to have a lot of questions, but I expect to have those questions be advanced questions, next level, things that we didn't necessarily cover in the class. Um, and with our, with our commercial embroidery equipment, um, that's definitely been the case. So when I started doing the Zoom classes for the commercial embroiderers, the reason I started to do that is they couldn't bring in their machines, similar to you guys. You can't bring this whole setup into the store and have everybody be operating their machines um, at the same time as the class is going on. So it's always been a hands-off situation. This kind of gives us a chance to be hands-on um, with me in one spot and you in your own environment. But with that commercial embroidery class, what we found is those customers they definitely grasped on to the information a little bit better than when they used to come into the store and everybody kind of got in a U shape around me in their chairs and watched me do things, you know, with a camera up on a big screen um, with the commercial machines. And so I think what happened is I now put them in an environment where they could be doing the same things along with me. So that's my hope for you guys. My hope for you guys is you guys are. In a, in a spot where you can work on your machine, where you can play with some things. Um, again, as you have questions, just you know, just unmute yourself, ask a question, 
uh, it it's helpful if you tell me who I'm speaking with because it doesn't always, the way I've had this set up, I have it pinned. So my image stays there so nobody loses me on their screen. So I don't always get to see who I'm talking with when I'm talking to you. So we're gonna start with your Bob and Winder, which is the very first place. And you have to do some assembly. So I'm gonna turn my camera around and I am a little one man band here for this. There's our nice, beautiful parking lot. But we're gonna switch this onto here. And so there's two different Bob and Winders that we're working with. This is gonna be the Bob and Winder for the Amara and the Forte. This is going to be the Bob and Winder for the Moxie. So a little bit different, but functionality, the way they work, it's, it's very much the same. You do have a little bit more control on this Bob and Winder here. So that is, is a, a thing. But when we're winding our bobbin, so first of all, you had to assemble your little uh, thread stand here. And so this little pin goes in, you tighten that down, and that washer actually is in the wrong spot. It's supposed to be underneath, so I can change that really quickly. Not hard to do. But you've got the spool support, and then you've got the um, thread stand, so or the thread guide, that's this guy up here. And then on the uh, Mara and the Forte bobbin winder, you have this little piece here. And some people are like, well, what the heck is that thing for? I'm gonna show you and explain how that works. And I think most of you have, have, is there anyone that has not put a quilt onto their frame and attempted to quilt it yet? If so, feel free to chime in and say, not me or whatnot. Um, or maybe you put it on, you just don't feel comfortable yet doing it. That's okay. So as we go through here, so everybody's been through this, this little spot, so we don't have to spend too much time. But once this is on, all you're gonna do is you're gonna take your thread, it's gonna come vertical, it's gonna go in through here. It's then gonna go through this little guide. You guys, this, this, this guide should be on a little bit of an angle. So it should be on an angle going from here into here, okay? So when we do that, we wanna take it in through, we're gonna thread it in through that little loop here. And then you have to go in and you have to floss it. And when I mean floss this, these are tension discs. So these little guys right here, those are your tension discs. This is the tension dial to adjust that. Your thread is going to need to go in through this disc. So here's the disc and it can't sit to the outside. I don't know if we can capture that on camera, we'll try. But right now, if we look on here, my thread is still sitting to the outside because I can see it and I'll show you. It's right there, there's my thread. So that thread needs to be flossed. So I grab it on both ends and you just pull it in and now it is inside that disc. You can't see it on there. So that's what we're looking for. That's the expectation when you're winding your bobbin is that you have that all the way in. It works the exact same way on the Moxie except for the thread is going to come up on the Moxie, the thread is going to be put on your stand. Let me move this up a little bit. Actually, we'll just slide that over. So on the Moxie, you're going to put your thread, there's a spool holder in the, on the, in the back here. So you're gonna put your thread on here. Your thread is gonna come vertical up onto there. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that your thread mast is all the way up. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna come from here. There is a guide right underneath here. So underneath, in this little spot here, you will see a guide in a minute, once we focus, that little guide right there. So that thread, your thread is going to come from the, the thread uh, stand down through that little guide. You need to go through there and then you have to do the same thing. You have to floss it inside that disc. Do not let it sit to the outside, it won't work. It's gonna have an issue. So. Once you're through the disc on both of these, the next thing that you are going to do is you're gonna come on here and you're gonna come straight over. You're going to take your bobbin and you're gonna come straight over from this little area. I've got some extra thread here. So we're gonna take this, it's gonna come from here and you're going to have your bobbin on. I already have one that's wound, but I'm gonna show you a couple little adjustments that you can make to this as well. So with your bobbin in place, what you're going to do is you would have your bobbin on here. What I do is I take 
And depending on the bobbin that you're working with, if you look on here, uh, when I do this, you see that little opening. So I'll usually thread the thread. I'm gonna grab a different bobbin. I think I've got one that's not loaded. Let me just check that out real quick. We're like most quilters. We try to keep, keep our bobbins loaded on there. They call these easy wine bobbins. And the reason they call them an easy wind is because it has that, that little opening. That's part of the, the easy side of this. So when we look at, at here, so these are the easy wine bobbins. And so that little spot that I was talking about is right in there. So now I can take my thread and I can go right in through here. So it's now threaded in through there. And then I can just take my bobbin. I can place it onto the bobbin winder. And I have that thread coming out of there. You, 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 hopefully you guys can see that. And then what I do, you guys, is I hold on to this and I hold on tight while it's spinning and the thread will break off. The last thing I want to do is let go of this and have the thread flip over the top of that. Believe it or not, that can actually have a crucial effect on your tension because a thread that is wrapped over the top. So if a thread was to wrap on here, if your thread wrapped over the top and then was wound into there, so it has this little guy here, as this is inside the machine, there's a point that it's always hitting where that is adding extra friction. So we don't want that. So the next thing that I'm going to do is I have it on and it's gonna be, it's on an auto fill. So it's gonna fill this automatically based off of where these sensors are. So we'll get into that in a minute. But I also have the speed on, on the uh, Amara and on the Forte bobbin winder, we have adjustable speed that you can play with. On the Moxie, it's a simple start and stop. So it's gonna be start and stop. Both of these you can adjust. So on the Moxie, there's a screw right here. This can be adjusted. This is a laser, um, a light beam that goes through here that is recognizing how full the bobbin is. So if you don't want as much bobbin or thread on your bobbin, you can take that screw, loosen it and move that in and that will adjust the amount of thread that gets put onto the bobbin. If yours is currently not giving you as much thread as you would like, you can adjust that out and that will give you more bobbin thread on there. On the, uh, this big guy here, same thing. There's a screw right in here. So we have a screw that you can loosen up and then this whole unit can be moved in and out and that will adjust um, the, the amount of thread that goes in onto your bobbin on there. So with that said, all we would do is we would go into here. I did come out of that little loop hole. So I wanna make sure that that's in there. If you need more tension, all you're gonna do is you're going to adjust it here, tighter or looser. Now what's gonna happen is if it's too tight, your bobbin is not gonna to want to wind. You want a really nice tightly wound bobbin, but if you go too tight, you can actually misshape one of these bobbins here. So you gotta be a little bit careful with that. Um, what we're going to do is I'm going to hold on to the thread. So I just kind of wrap it around my finger and hold on. And I'm going to pull. I just broke it doing that. So I'm a little tight already, I know. So I'm going to loosen that because I did tighten it when I kind of was showing you. So I'm going to put it back through here and get it ready to go. But what you're going to do is you're going to allow the system to wind that bobbin. And you don't want it to be... Uh, like a sponge. You don't want to be able to push on that thread and, and really pull on it. So at this point, if I'm ready, I can adjust my speed to wherever I want. I usually wind it about a six or seven. Um, delicate threads are going to require a slower speed. So if you're working with, you know, metallic threads um, or lighter weight threads, you would want to slow that speed down. As this is actually so fine, so it's super uh, uh, thin is the thread that I grabbed. So when I hit this start button, all of a sudden this is going to start to, to go and I'm just going to pull on the thread until it breaks off. So it just broke off of there. That way I know it doesn't end up with extra thread, again, going up over the top of that. I've seen that be the issue for some people um, when I've done a Zoom or not a Zoom call, but a, like a FaceTime call 
I look at their bobbin and I find out that that's actually part of the culprit. Now, you want a nice evenly wound bobbin. So as this is winding, you're watching to see, does it look like it's winding evenly across? If it is not, there is an adjustment, you guys, on here. That's what this little guy does. So this will actually, if I were to rotate it, you're gonna have maybe a hard time seeing on here, but if I rotate this, watch what happens to this little guy here. It's moving in one direction. If I rotate it the other way, it's going to move out. So you can make an adjustment on here. If your thread is winding too much to this side up here, then this whole thing needs to go in. If it's winding too much to the inside, then the whole thing needs to come out. So that's one difference in the bobbin winder between the two. On the on the on the uh, the Moxie, it doesn't have that adjustment on there. So you kind of have to watch and just do that thing. So now I've got that issue happening after making those adjustments. So I'm gonna while it's winding, I'm just gonna sorry, I'm just gonna spin that and get more of an even wind. So it was all wind. It started to all wind on this right on this left side. And now we got it back to going to an even wind. Are there any questions on that, on winding the bobbin? So we're gonna let it go through and do its thing. And it looks like I'm still a little imbalanced off of there. So you gotta kind of watch for that because I got it a little bit too far to the one side. And this particular bobbin needs to have the adjustment on here. Because right now this is completely full. So I would need to, I won't do it, but I would, I will later. Uh, we would use I don't have the screwdriver. You'd take your screwdriver loose in that and slide this forward. Because right now this went all the way past and wanted to keep winding even further. You can see that. And that's gonna happen, you guys. If you're if you're winding your bobbin and you don't have this setup set to where you want it to be, if it's winding too full, loosen that screw, slide it in, and then you won't end up with this happening on there. So these are all things that I see that happen with customers as they're trying to get these, these uh, their basics down. And everything, again, starts with the bobbin. So you really need to have this set to where it's going to work. You want to be able to take this and you kind of push on your thread. And you, want to, you don't want it to, like I said, you don't want it to be like a sponge. This is really nice and tight. And that's what we're looking for in a nice, even wound bobbin on there. So that's going to be winding bobbins. That's where we first start. And then from there, we move on to the, the next part, which is tensioning your bobbin. So I'm going to flip the camera around and we're going to talk about tensions and how that works on our system. So we're going to just take the bobbin right out of that bobbin case over here. And what we're going to do is So the first thing that you need to do, you guys, you need to have, I'm gonna switch this on here, but you need to have on here, you're gonna to need to have a um, fully wound bobbin when you do this. And the reason why is this is, we're using gravity to determine if we have a good tension on our bobbin case. So because we're using gravity, if you're using a really uh, only half wound bobbin, what's gonna happen is that changes the weight at which things are going to be pulled down, okay? So when you're doing that, you're gonna to wanna to take a nice full bobbin and you're gonna to wanna to make sure that it is ready to go. So I'm going to grab also another little tool of mine, couple tools. So you have a lot of little gadgets that came with your machine. And one of them that I'm gonna look for is my little screwdriver. And I have been threatened with my life by my wife to make sure all this stuff ends up back in the same spot when, it, when it's all done. Probably won't happen, but we'll, we'll do our best. So we're going to take our bobbin. We're going to place it in. Now, I'm going to show you guys something really quick in here. Um, this is on the inside. You're going to see there's, a, there's a, a spring in there. So this spring that is in here needs to be a part of in your bobbin case. Okay. Every once in a while, I, again, I get a phone call and we're trying to troubleshoot over the phone. And I say, well, let's just take out your bobbin. Let's take a look. And sometimes that little guy's missing. That's gotta be there. It's an anti-lash spring, um, backlash spring. So what it does, you guys, it, it really stops the bobbin from constantly over-rotating. So when you're quilting away, you've got all these different speeds and things happening and you go to slow down and speed up, your bobbin can continue to rotate further than you want it to if that is not in there. 
Um, I'm going to make a very strong recommendation that everyone um, invest into a second bobbin case. I think for a lot of reasons. Um, one, the last thing you want to have happen is you're working on a quilt, something's not working right, and it's you know nine o'clock at night, and Nettles is closed, or it's the weekend, even worse yet, Saturday night, you're ready to get some things done, and you have issues with your tension. Having a second bobbin case at least allows you to to continue through and get your work done. Um, the other reason I like to have a second bobbin case is I like to have one that I that I set for the main threads that I work with. And then I like to have one that I can just constantly adjust back and forth. So you're going to find there's certain threads and certain weights and so forth that you're going to fall in love with. And then you're going to have some threads that you're constantly going to be adjusting for. I find it more useful to, to keep one good bobbin case that I, that I use on a regular basis with little adjusting. And, you know, maybe just put a mark on it so you know which one is, is which. Uh, hey, so before that's a you go on, I have a quick question. If that yeah. little spring thing comes out. How do you know, Does is there a right or wrong way to put that back? Yeah, there is. I, I'll pop one out and I'll show it to you. That's a great question. So let me flip this around. And actually, let me just take this the spring out. There is a right and a wrong way. Um, so I just pulled that out. So if you were to really look at this, kind of tricky, but let me see if I can do it on the table. That will probably be easier. So if we were to go in and we were to look at this guy on here, there's going to be one side of this, you guys. One side is going to be narrow and one side is going to be wider. So if you look on here and what I mean by narrow and wider, these little forks that stick out, this side is wider than this side here. Okay. So there's a definite um, difference in, in that, that portion. And on here, on your bobbin case, the way it sets up, one side can handle the whip and one side can't handle the whip going as wide. One thing that you want to do is you're basically, when I flip that over, and you guys can maybe see this, but underneath here, this is actually sticking up higher. This is the spring. So it's sticking up higher. So one thing to think about is that's what you're looking for when you place that in. So when you place this guy in, you want that spring to be popping up. And so when you place this in, that bigger side is going to go to this left side over here, if I was looking at the bobbin in this, this way. So I'm gonna take that, I'm going to pop this into there, and you're going to push this down until you'll feel it kind of lock in. If you push down on that and you can still rotate, so if I could still, sorry, if I could still rotate this around, this spring, if I was able to, to go like this and it started to move, then it's not locked in. Right now it's locked in because it's not moving when I'm putting a little bit of pressure onto it. Okay, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Good. Okay, so as we go through this, the Eric, next thing that we're going to do is those, we're, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt, do those springs ever go bad? Um. They do only if they come out and you end up misshaping it. They don't oh. tip it. They don't, they don't over it. Like if it never comes out of here, I shouldn't say it couldn't happen. I've just not seen it to where one's gone bad in the case. I've seen it where one's come out and somebody says this fell out. I went to put it back in. It doesn't seem right. And it's bent and I can see the bend in it. And then we, we, you guys, we try to stock these as replacements, um, the little spring. So it's not a bad idea to have that on hand, but again, I really think having a second Baba case, even if it's just a matter of, I don't have the spring in there, the spring is damaged, use the other one so you can get a new spring, but it's nice to have that other one to have a tension set to. So when you place your bobbin into your bobbin case, you're gonna to wanna to take your bobbin, you're gonna place it Becky, in. And can I ask you a question? Yes, I'm sorry. Absolutely. No, don't be sorry, you guys. This is, uh, just so you guys know, I want this to be more interactive. It's a much better session for me if it is. Otherwise, I'm just here talking to this mindless camera. So go for I it, Becky. Have, I have the Avante and I got it okay. from you used, um, but everything was perfect. However, looking at my bobbin, I don't have one of those springs in it, my bobbin case. Yeah. Um, and so, I've never known that I needed that. And I've been using my machine. Is that going to hurt anything? Have I damaged anything by not having that in there? No, it won't damage anything. What's going to happen? So the older machines, this is all stuff that that uh, 
as other companies do things, right? Everybody kind of finds out, is this a good thing or a bad thing? So Handy Quilter originally didn't have that back spring in there, that backlash spring. So it's, it's not going to hurt anything. Um, it's just taking everything a step further. So you're going to find that things are going to be more consistent, especially if you use, do you use pre-wounds at all? Becky? Um, no, I'm sorry. I'm, okay. I'm new at this, so I'm trying to learn how to do it. No, no I, you're great. I wind my own. Okay. So you're going to find when you wind your own, you're going to have less issues not having that backlash spring in. If you use pre-wounds, it's, it's, it's almost imperative that you have that in there. So something so to that, keep in mind. So will that also make a difference on the tension, on how the tension works with it? It does. It makes it more accurate because it doesn't allow your bobbin to over rotate and leave extra thread in the bobbin before the stitch is formed. And, and so this same bobbin case is available. You can get one for the Avante. So it's, it's definitely available. And I, I think, you know, like I said, maybe that could be your second bobbin case as we we're suggesting. Thank you. Absolutely. So the next thing that we're going to do is you're going to take your bobbin. You're going to put it into your bobbin case. When you look at your bobbin case, that bobbin should spin. When you're looking at it, it should spin clockwise when you pull on the thread. Okay. So once it's in there, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to, I put a little pressure down on the bobbin and then you're going to see there's a little slit on the side. So that little slit is where your thread has to come through. So you're gonna take your thread in through that slit and then you're gonna pull it over until it goes behind. This is called the tension spring. So this whole piece here is a tension spring, okay? So you wanna get it into there. It has to look like this. So it's coming out of that little slot. That's what we're looking for. And now we're going to go in and do our, our pre -ten well, our tensioning of this bobbin case. So I'm going to kind of screw it up first. So it's not great. And what I'm going to do is I've now got this bobbin in my left hand. With my right hand, I'm just gonna wrap the thread around my finger right here and I hold it. So I'm holding the thread between this finger and wrapped around this one. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have this in my hand and I'm gonna lift up. And if you notice, can you guys see the thread okay? I don't know if that shows up on your end. Yes. I can see the thread quite well. Yeah. Yes. Good. Okay. So when we pull up, what's happening is that bobbin, it's spinning and threads coming out. This tells me it's too loose. I want that bobbin to stand up off of my hand. I want it to stand up. So that's too loose. So what you would do to make your changes, we're going to sneak up into here and I'm going to show you. There's two screws on here. There's this screw, it's a bigger screw. This screw is the screw that holds the spring onto the system. So if you guys want to grab your bobbin, you can do this and look at it while, we're, while I'm working on it or explaining it. But that little spring is what holds the, the screw, or the, the, that little screw, sorry, is what holds the spring in place. This one is the one that makes the adjustment to our tension. If you turn it righty tighty, so clockwise, you're going to tighten the tension. Lefty loosey, you're going to loosen the tension. So I know I need to tighten this. And I can tell you on your bobbin case, think of it as a clock. If you go from one o'clock to two o'clock, that's a pretty big change in tension because that diameter of that screw is just so small. But I'm going to, I'm, so I, if I was new to this, I realized my tension's too loose. So I'm going to adjust it. And I usually make too much of an adjustment which is what I just did now. So now what's gonna happen is I've got my bobbin in my hand. I lift up and look. So that's the opposite. That tells me, even if I jiggle my finger a little bit, it doesn't move. That tells me it's too tight, okay? So it's really that easy. So now it's the, the hard part is making, and it's not hard, it's just, you just have to do it, is keep adjusting this screw in the direction. So now I'm gonna loosen it because it's too tight. And I'm going to keep playing this game. So I'm going to lift it up. I want it to lift up, which it's doing. And when I lift up my finger, it stood up and it's coming free. So now I'm pretty close to where I like it. Here's what I'm going to do to test it. I'm now going to move my left hand down. And if it feels like it would just fall really fast, 
then it's still just a little too loose. I want this eventually, guys, I want this to just slowly move down on its own. So I'm going to take this. It's just a hair too loose. I'm going to make an adjustment. My adjustment is from 12, not to all the way to one. That's what I just did. So I'm going to check on there. And we're going to take this guy now. And we're going to do the same thing. It stands up. I move my hand down. It's moving with it. And now as I go, and it's really a feel that you're going to feel a little more tight. I need to tighten it just a hair more. But you guys, it's, it's, it's hard to, to explain, but there is a feel. So right now, as I'm dropping this, there's getting a little bit of clearance in between my hand and the case. So I'm going to keep doing that until I get to a point where now it's kind of holding. And if I just lightly jiggle it, it's going to start to, to move down. So right now, I'm pretty good, pretty set with my bobbin tension. Back it up just a slight amount. That's your baseline. So we always want to do that just to make sure every time I put in, even if it's the same brand of thread. So whenever you go in and you change out your bobbin, I think it's really good practice. Because what you're going to find is most of the time, it's just going to be accurate. It's going to be ready to go. But the last thing you want to find out is that it's not accurate and you find that out on your quilt, right? That's not our plan. Our plan is never to find out that something is not uh, correct on the quilt. So with that said, our bobbin tension is now set. Um, the, there's some maintenance involved with doing your bobbin case and I don't have it back here, but I'm, I'm gonna explain it. So inside here where that little spring lives, so where this spring is, sometimes you can end up having lint underneath here. And what you don't want to do is you don't want to take your screwdriver or a pin and scrape inside there. That's not how we get that out. What I usually will do is I'll just take like um, either like a business card, something that has a little bit of strength to it, card stock, what have you. Um, you know, you could take a crisp dollar bill something and then just take it and rub it right underneath that spring on there. Let me see if I've got something that I could use back here to do that with. And I'm just gonna take the corner of this little book even. All right, so different company, the Grace Company is cleaning out the handy quilter bobbin case. But we're gonna go into here. So I'm just gonna take this and I'm gonna put it up underneath here. I'm gonna switch this to the white side so you guys can see this maybe a little bit better. So all I'm gonna do is take this piece of paper. I'm gonna slide it up underneath there and I'm just gonna slide forward. You see that? It lifts that spring out and then I can just clean. That, that will get anything from underneath there just out of there. Sometimes you have thread that uh, builds up in there. You can have just, you know, lint, it could be anything. So I'll have sometimes uh, times where a customer will call and they'll say, hey, I can't get my bobbin tension right. No matter what I do, the bobbin just keeps falling straight down and I've got the screw tightened all the way. And just cleaning that little area out, that usually that's the solution. Now, that spring can get compromised. You may have to have a replacement of that at some, at some point. Um, so it can get compromised over time, uh, lose its spring a little bit, but cleaning it out will make a big difference. Sometimes also certain threads have a finish on them. They can leave a little bit of that finish on the bobbin uh, case itself on the inside. So just running something through there periodically will, will help clean that out. So you wanna make sure that you're doing that, that maintenance on the bobbin case. That's your bobbin case. Um, now what we're gonna do is I'm going to, I'm gonna attempt to really lower, actually I'm gonna move some things. So I'm going to take off some rails and I'm gonna lower my camera down because I really wanna get to the inside of the bobbin case to show you something that's really cool underneath. So I've got one rail that I'm taking off here. And then I'm going to remove the next rail as well. All right. 
And then I'm going to adjust the camera. I'm going to have to do this and adjust the height. And I'm going to go grab me some canned air. So I was going to clean our machine out beforehand. And then I thought, no, that doesn't make sense because I really need customers to see how this works. So I left it as is. So you guys can see that what, it, what it's like when you really go in and have to clean these things out. So this is gonna take a minute for me to get this down here. We're gonna adjust this. One thing that's really cool, and look, there's, there's all sorts of fun stuff underneath there. You guys are gonna be able to see, I'm gonna drop it one more level so I can be a little more direct. But if you look underneath there, there's thread that I can see behind the hook. So I can see that. You guys can probably see that as well. And there's a lot of lint in here. And this will happen. And all these things, you guys, are going to have an effect on the way that your machine stitches out. So we're going to get this down in. All right. Now... One really cool thing on um, the Amara and the Forte is they have a light in, underneath. So you have a lighted bobbin case or, or hook system. So now inside there, you can see there's a whole bunch of stuff just in there. This will happen. You're gonna wanna get that all cleaned out. I'm gonna grab um, some canned air really quick. I thought it ha I had it back here. Now on your older machine, so uh, Becky, you said you have an Avante. You got to be careful with canned air on an Avante because if you look in there, and I, I can't remember if the Avante, I don't think it has a shield. So you might take a look at yours, Becky, and see, but a shield means that there's something right here. There's a big uh, uh, plastic piece that keeps all of our stuff from going back in there. And so on our older machines, we didn't necessarily have that. And so we always just recommended taking your a lint brush and you want a high quality lint brush. This one's got the nylon bristles that came with your machine. You want something where those bristles aren't gonna come out and be in the machine. But what I usually will do is I'll take this and just kind of clean this guy out underneath here. So this is all just lint that's hanging out in our machine. And then what I would do is if I see those little threads that are back in the back there, my lint brush can even help me get to those really easy. If I can't get to those with that, then what I would do is I would get my tweezers out and kind of pull those through. There's also another thread up in here. And again, that happens. So the next thing that you could do, I'm not going to do it because I think we're pretty, pretty clean out here, is I would then take, if you have an Avante, or sorry, an Amara or a Forte, um, and even the Moxie as well, you've got a shield right here. So using canned air, I will get some canned air and just show you. Using canned air on there doesn't have a negative effect on the machine. So I'm going to go grab that and hopefully you guys can still hear me. And then I'm going to grab some oil as well. So keeping your machine maintained is, you know, it's a big deal. I mean, we, we all spend a lot for these products. And the last thing we need to do is, is not have that being well maintained. Up on top, there's two screws. There's one here and one here. Um, periodically, I'll take those off and just really do a good deep clean so you can clean those out. So with, their, with my canned air, there's a couple things that you want to be uh, careful of, you guys, with canned air. So some people say you can't use canned air or shouldn't use canned air. I'm not, I don't believe that. So um, they say not to use canned air because of uh, the moisture that it can put into the machine. If you're using canned air the proper way, just vertically, look at, there's, you guys probably can't see that because I'm not zoomed in. But if you use it vertically and you're not shaking it, you're gonna be fine. If you turn it this way, then you're gonna get that condensation coming out. Or if you shake it a lot, then you'll get condensation. If you just keep it straight and you just use verse, it's pure air, okay? Even when you, I like, we have big, big air compressors that we use in the shops to clean machines out. And those air compressors, 
they also have condensation because there's a there's a little button or a lever that we use to 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 release the condensation. So right now we're on the inside of the hook. It's lit up, which is awesome. So that's a cool feature on again the uh, the Forte and the the Amara. And now I'm just going to take and I'm going to blow all this stuff out in here. Okay. Uh, it's paying special attention to everything right inside here too. So once you've done that, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to take some oil. So I've got this little oil zoom spout deal. So this kind of, I'm too zoomed in to show you. I'll show you in a minute. But this is what it looks like. There's a little screw on lid. You can pull that up. And then what you're going to do is you're just going to take this, take off the top, and then you're going to put a drop of oil right here. Okay? So right on top of this little ledge where the two pieces meet. You're going to, two metal pieces meet. You're going to put one drop right in there. And that's it. Just one drop. If you end up putting too much oil in there, it won't hurt your machine, but it's going to, it can, it can cause tension issues until that oil gets worked out. Um, it can also come out on your fabric. So you don't want to put too much in there. If you get too much, you can just take some, you know, cloth or batting and just kind of dab it in there and that'll take it out. Any questions on oiling that, that bobbin area? It's really pretty easy. So now we're going to, uh, we'll leave it zoomed in because we're going to put the bobbin case back in next. And so next thing we're going to do, we've now tensioned our bobbin case. And again, this is, this is exactly the way that I go through working on these machines. So we're going to take, and you're just going to, when you put your bobbin case in, um, that little part, this, this little guy, you can hold that. But I wouldn't, it's, it, it's, it can kind of hold the bobbin case if in if it's quite right. But I don't like to hold it and angle it in. Just kind of take it and go straight in. And then on that right side over here, that needs to line up and you're gonna feel and you'll hear a click when it's all the way in. Do a little pull on the bobbin thread and make sure that it's in. Cause if it's not in, a lot of times when you pull on your bobbin thread, it will pull the bobbin out if it's not locked in all the way. So that's the bobbin area and the bobbin case. So let's kind of move back into regular mode. I'm going to get my camera reestablished. So it's going to take a minute here. I am really happy that you guys joined us today for the for this class. I, I know for some of us it it's probably a it was a I don't know about this Zoom thing. But I really, really, really strongly believe that you're going to have a better experience with your machine um, being able to work with it at home as we, as we do even more things. So let me just get this guy tightened up. Now we're going to go. All right. Hopefully that's good. We'll find out. Okay, so that is um, putting your bobbin thread into, or your uh, bobbin case into your machine. I usually at the bottom, I'll just go in and zoom out here. So I'll usually just take the thread and I just clip it off down here a little bit below the bobbin, the open door anyway. So I'd use scissors, not, 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 my, not my finger scissors. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to work um, up in the top part of the machine. So I'm going to slide the machine down a little bit on my frame. And I'm going to move the camera over to get to that spot. Are there any questions before I move forward with bobbins? No? All right. Moving on. Hey, so Eric, uh, yes, essentially, sir. this is uh, this particular um, session is kind of your setup process. This is how you go about getting prepared before you load 
a quilt on. And I'm not a quilter, so forgive me. But no, you're, you're, those are the right questions. Yeah, this is exactly what I would go through every single time. Your machine deserves to have uh, new maintenance. I mean, every time I, I go in, so about every two bobbins, I'll at least put oil in the machine. Okay. Um, every quilt that I go on to, you're going to put a new needle on there. I think it's important to do that. So these are all things that exactly what you were saying that we would do um, as we're going to work on each quilt on there. Clean out that bobbin area, make sure it's nice and tidy and ready to go. Okay, so hopefully I don't lose anyone or lose all of you because I wouldn't just lose one. I would lose them, lose you all. Um, all right. I should send you guys a picture of my setup. I got cords all over the place in, in this, this little environment. Okay, so we are now going to go in and we're going to thread the machine. And so I have the Pro Stitcher. That's that computer that you see up on top there that's kind of in, in the, the view. Um, we can go in and we can kind of move these out of the way for different spots. So I'm going to kind of move it down there. And then as I move down, I'll move it out of the way from that. But what you're going to do, and this is a, a little bit different on the Moxie, but very similar. You're going to come straight up. You're going to go in through here. And before I move too far on, you guys, about an hour before the class started, I also sent you guys, and I pulled them, I pulled them directly off of Handy Quilter's website, but I sent you guys um, some PDF files that are just, and again, they're on Handy Quilter's website, uh, but just good information. So if you didn't receive that, check your email. It's, it, it'll be in there. And it's just uh, tips and tricks for different things. I can pull them up on my screen later if we want to. So all we're going to do is we're going to go in and I'm going to zoom this out just a little bit. So up on top, you're going to start, you're going to take your thread from here. You're going to come up to uh, your uh, guide and you want to make sure that you're going vertical. So whatever thread guide is, or that post you're on, you want to go to that guide. You're going to come down and you're going to go right through this little guy here. Now. The next thing is really something that you're gonna play with. So there's three little loops on here. So this is a pretensioner. It's to help take out some of the twist that happens in the thread as it's moving at high speeds. So certain threads, and, and, and what you really need to do, you guys, is you gotta experiment a little bit. Do some protest sewing. What I find to work for most threads is I go through the first one. So I come from the back to the front. And I go from, I go through the first one. And then I take that and I loop it around. So I go from there, I go around that. So I go from the back to the front in here. Then I loop it around. I skip the second hole and I go into the third one. Why? Okay. Um, and the reason that I do that is I find that sometimes when I go around all three of those, it adds too much friction to my threads as they're passing through. And it's not necessary for the majority of the threads that I work with. Now, you might have a different thread that you prefer that you work with. I, I, I like, there's a product that we have that, and my wife even likes certain threads herself, but finesse thread, I work with that a lot. And it's just, it's smooth. It's awesome. And it works perfectly for me. So I'm going to take that through there. So that's what I do in most cases. Next, we're going to go in and there's a guide that is right here. So you're going to take your thread and you're going to go into here. And on the Moxie, you guys, it's, it's the same except for you don't have this guy here. So on the Moxie, you're going to go from your thread spin uh, spool up to the guide and then from the, the guide directly down to this, uh, the three holes that are on here. And on the Moxie, it's kind of at an angle a little bit, it's not straight up and down typically. So now you're gonna go from here and you're gonna take this and you're gonna go into that next little spot. So I'll, I'll kind of zoom it down into here for that. So next you're gonna take, this is super critical this whole area here. Um, 
this is going to go into this guide right here. And again, on the Moxie, it's the same at this point. So you're going to go in through there. You're going to go from the back. You're going to go around here and there's tension discs. Remember when I was doing your bobbin winder, how I showed you those discs and how it has to be flossed into there? This has to be the same way. So I go underneath and I'm going to hook it into that area there. All right. Now I'm going to move my machine over. So I want to see if I can show you more of a straight on view of something that I find that happens sometimes. So in here, Another thing that I see will happen is that is your tension spring. And so sometimes what I find will happen is your thread is not necessarily in between the discs. I'm flossing it in there. So it's not inside the discs. Sometimes it's sitting behind the disc in the backside. But I've also seen a lot of times where it gets caught in the springs it's themselves and you say well but it feels like it has tension well it does because it's hooked onto something it's got to be inside those discs now in a very rare i'm going to say this i always hesitate to say it because it's in a very rare instance when you're working with some of your because we have a lot of people that are embroidering with polyester embroidery threads um all the time actually uh, a lot of people uh superior has one magnifico um, some people use ice cord, some people use Floriani, lots of different threads. And you should try all those threads. But sometimes the way that those are manufactured, they're really slick and they can pop out of these tension discs. I'm going to repeat what I said before. In a very rare instance, because it's not every time you use that thread, what can happen is at high speed, your thread can pop out of that disc. If you find that to be the case, and most of you will never run into it, but if you find that to be the case, you could go, you would go around this disc twice. So one full time and then a second time in through there. Okay. Never should that be your first option. So I'm going to undo what I just had. We're going to get back to, to normal. <clears throat> so right now my thread is not in there. I'm going to take, I'm going to floss it in on both sides. So it's flossed in. Then the next thing that you're going to do, you're going to change that camera angle. Yeah. And real this quick, one. Eric, this yes, is sir. called the tensioner, correct? Yep. This is the, the tension, the upper tension. Upper tension. Yep. So just for reference later, that's the upper tension. And yes, sir. You can... You can pull those. Is it okay to just like pull that one disc back against the spring and you pull? could, except for you don't, I wouldn't, you're going to find that thread's going to slide in there really pretty easily. So you don't really need to pull it's back. Not and reason harm that, anything, what's that? I did, it's not going to harm anything to just pull that back. It won't I, harm I anything. It's just because I didn't know how it worked. So I was just, yeah, it won't, it, it won't harm anything. So you're okay. okay. It's not going to hurt it. Yeah. Um, it just shouldn't take that much to get it in there. So once that's inside there, the next thing you're going to do is you're not going to go underneath this. That's not the next move. So I've seen that happen too. So let me do this. So you're not going to take your thread and go underneath this part next. Like, oh, like that. <clears throat> so you're not going underneath this next. You're going to come in front of this. You're going to go all the way up. So you're still, you're coming up into the tension disc even higher. You're going to go behind. So right here is a little spring. You're going to pull the thread up, go behind that opening of the spring, and then you're going to come forward. So that spring now should do this. If you were to put a little bit of tension on it, that spring, so I'll move my hand up. So if I'm pulling on this, that spring moves. It's called a check spring. That check spring, if it does not move, so this might answer some questions for some of you. If that check spring is not moving, that's what tells the machine if you have a thread break or not. Okay? So if that check spring is not actively moving, then what happens is that behind there, it's connected to a sensor. 
And then what it does is it tells the machine, and I actually came out of this guide, so I'm going to put it back in there. I just noticed that. But it tells the machine, um, when that check spring isn't moving, it tells the machine there's an issue with your threads. So we have that situation. It thinks the thread is broken when in fact it's not. I do yep. see that spring, and I apologize, I forgot the name of that Check spring. Check spring? Yeah. We see it moving freely, nice and smooth, just like that, but it it still thinks that it's breaking. And I was thinking that's where the sensor would be. Is it possible we just have a bad sensor? Yeah. Okay. It's that's definitely possible. Thought. Is and that so here's a check spring part of the upper tensioner uh, assembly? It okay. is. So, so it'd be I'll replaced as a whole? I'll tell you, yeah, I'll tell you the, the easy thing that, that could happen. And, and we'll do a private call to, to verify all this, right? Okay, thank you. But it may be as simple as there's a screw on here that we can undo and this whole unit can come off and be replaced. Okay, thank if you. If need be, but, 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 but there could be something else too. So I don't want to just start that way, but that's where we'll definitely get in and figure it out for you, okay? okay. So you. once you... Once you've gone through that, that spring, now is the time that you're going to come back down. You're going to go underneath this little bar here. So you're going to go underneath that. And now you're going to, let me get those cords out of the way. Got the cords to our pro stitcher. So I'm underneath that little bar. I'm going to come straight up underneath that bar. And I am going to go in from the right side. And through, this is called a take-up lever. In through the take-up lever. So from back to front, so from right to left when you're looking at it. And now you should be able to really see that spring being active every time I pull on the thread. Okay? From there, the next thing that you're going to do is you're going to go in through this little guide here. You're just going to take it around that and into there. And again, guys, on the Moxie, it's the exact same. Nothing's changed. We're, we're all doing the same thing right now. Um, the Moxie does not have that upper thread sensor the same way that this one does. So a little bit different in the look, but it's all the same that way. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go from here down to the needle. And at the needle, there's another guide. This guide always, not always, but this guide sometimes gets missed. Where are we going? Okay. So let's talk about this for a second. There's an actual little guide right here that you're going to take your threads through. So all you're going to do now is you're going to go in and you're going to put it through there. But I'm not ready to do that because if I was doing a new quilt, there's more to it. I'm going to move that a little bit. I would go in and the next thing that I would be doing is not putting it through the eye of the needle, but I would be changing the needle itself, okay? So we're gonna go in, and you have a little hex, uh, should have a little hex wrench. It's not mine. Let me see if where's, where ours is. I've got all the tools except for that one. And, and guess who's going to be blamed for it? It's going to be me. You guys are my uh -huh. witness. You guys are, this is on record. So I'm going to, I'm going to have to play this back. So I'll tell you what you would do. And I'm not, because I don't see it here and I don't want to waste everyone's time. What you would do is you would take and you would loosen this little screw. So this would get loosened up with the, the wrench on there. You would loosen that and you'd put a new needle in. Now, next week, because we don't have them and it's not sold by Handy Quilter, I'm hoping I have them in. I have a little magnet that I use that I put on the front of this needle that helps tell me if the needle is in straight or not. So next week, that's my plan is to show you one of those. They're 10 bucks. It'll be the best $10 you spend. Because here's what happens, you guys. Your needles are at the top are round. So on your home sewing machine, I'm gonna grab a needle out of here. On your home sewing machine, your needles have a flat back. 
So on your home sewing machine, you, you always get them in the right way because there's, you, you can't put them in the wrong way. It's pretty smart. But on a commercial needle, that whole top, I'm rotating it, it's just round. There is no flat back to these, okay? So getting that needle in the right way is, is super crucial. If you look at this needle, you guys, will, you guys can actually see that pretty decent. If you look at this needle, there is a groove that's running down the front part of it. That's the front part of the needle. And as I rotate the needle, the backside has a scarf. There's like a little cutout that you see right in here. That's where the hook comes around and grabs your thread. So the front side is where that groove is. The back side is the scarf. When you're putting the needle into the machine, slide this baby down. And we're gonna get in front of our machine a little bit more. So when you're putting that needle into the machine, you gotta have that straight part of the needle right here in the front and you can feel it. Like I've, I've got to, I'm gonna go out to the side. I, if I put a needle in there, I can feel that groove. You can see that groove. Sometimes people will say, well, I just use a needle and I put it in through the eye of the needle and then I can tell if it's straight. I'm not sure that's true because I see people that do that and they tell me their needle's straight and then I take the magnet and what the magnet does you guys is you put it on the, on the front of the needle, you move your hand and that magnet is going to sway either left or right or straight. So it's really a, a pretty big advantage to have that. So if your needle is in, in the machine incorrectly. This might be a good time. I'm going to pull up. I'm going to pull up uh, and, and share on my screen some of the stuff I, I emailed out to you guys about an hour ago. And some of you might have already downloaded it. Some of you may have looked at it. I'm going to share my screen. So give me a second here. And I want to write down the name of that magnet. It, what's it called? Just a needle magnet? Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the exact name next time, only because um, I get them from the Grace Company and I order them in, I order them like 50 at a time. They're, they're a lifesaver. They're awesome. So there's a lot of things. So these are some of, these are all the things that I kind of emailed out to you guys. And we're going to talk about tensions and all that. So you have these, these are all emailed out. Um, it talks about how, you know, how, how you should hold your arm and your hands when quilting. But maintenance checklist, there is one in here, right here, says, help, I have skip stitches. Um, it tells you the some of the, the issues. And you guys might not be able to see it. It's kind of small on your screen, I'm sure. But it says on here, uh, well, I can zoom in. You guys see that OK? Yeah, just so you know. Um, I, I'm not super familiar with Zoom, and there's a big block with our participant participants on the right side of the screen. Oh, thank did it, you. Did it, no. did it move away a little bit? Sure, much better. Great. So on here it says help. I have skipped stitches. Um, needle, and it's telling you what it could be. Needle's not facing forward. Needle's in backward. You guys, this is this one right here. Happens all the time, it's probably the, the thing that we find the most to be the biggest issue, and I do it myself. So you, you're, no one's to blame, it just happens, all right? If I don't have that magnet, the magnet shows you really quickly that that's not gonna work. Um, but this happens all the time. Needle is bent, has a burr or dull point. That's really important, I'm gonna talk about that in a minute here. Hook is damaged. Well, if your hook is damaged, that's something completely different that we have to look at, all right? These other things you, you, you can, you can uh, take care of on your own. Poor quality of thread, that happens as well. Tension is too tight. Machine thread improper. If, uh, if necessary, rotate needle clockwise to just past 630. So imagine that your needle, right? So you're in there. And let's go back into here. I'm going to. I got somebody coming in, got a new participant. We're gonna stop sharing for a second. 
Come on. Okay. So let's imagine in here that your needle right now, let's say that this is at six o'clock. What they're saying to do is loosen this screw and rotate that needle. So instead of it being, I'm gonna, we're gonna pretend at six o'clock, they're saying take that and rotate it to 6.30, okay? So that's their suggestion and it does work, believe it or not. What it does, uh, well, I, I won't get into all the deep. Give me one second, I'm gonna mute a couple of these. Okay, so what it does do, and I'm gonna share my screen again. So what it does do by rotating it is it changes without getting into all the details of the technical side, it changes what they call the loop, um, the loop spacing and the loop lift. Okay, so that's for skip stitches. You guys have this in your, your uh, email up here. Look at this one. Help, my thread is shredding or breaking. Those are two different things. Skip stitches means that you still have thread up in your top uh, threaded through the needle, but it's not connecting a stitch. That's skip stitches, okay? My thread is shredding or breaking. Now it's telling you it could be any of these things. Incorrect size needle for the thread. That happens, that's a big thing. Old thread, poor quality. You guys are seeing a theme there. Burr on the hook, burr on the needle. Burr on the needle bar thread guide. Um, lint in the thread guides or tension disc. This one here, that tension disc, that's a biggie. So the thread tension disc that we went through, every once in a while, I'll take like a piece of muslin, a piece of uh, nice quilter's cotton, and I'll just rub it through the tension discs without any thread in there. So I'll show you guys how to do that. It'll clean it out, okay? Needle in backwards. Again, I've done it before, it happens. But if you're getting thread breaks or shredding, you in most cases, you wanna rotate the needle counterclockwise to 530. Now. If you don't remember all this, it's fine. Rotate the needle one direction. Did it make it better or worse? It made it worse. Okay, you went the wrong direction. Go back the other way. All right? So there's all these other things. Help, my needle is broke. Uh, and it talks about all the different things in there. So I'm gonna stop sharing this. But again, you guys have that in your, in your email. Okay? So I'm gonna finish threading this. Then I wanna take a second to really talk about needles. So the only thing I need to do to finish this is I need to go through that upper thread guide that's above the, the needle itself. So we're gonna take right here and we're gonna go through that little thread guide. And I should have had my scissors over here. I'm gonna go grab me just the, some of my little, I usually have like a pair of zinger scissors that I've, I pull off and use. Mm -hmm. Let me grab some of those. Hey, real quick one, Eric. Uh, what's, as far as the needle and the size of the hole in the needle, what's bigger, a 16 or an 18? I assume an 18. Eight, an 18 is bigger. Got it. Bigger hole. Okay, thank you. You bet. And it's confusing because when you talk about the size of thread, the diameter, the higher the number, like a 60 weight thread, that's actually smaller than a 50 weight. So they get confusing, but wow. on, ne on needles, it, on needles, it's easy. The bigger the, the bigger the, uh, the bigger the number, the bigger the, the shaft is and the eye on there. So I went through that one thread guide right here. And now we're gonna go in, I'll let that refocus. And then we're gonna just take and go through the eye of the needle front to back in through there, okay? Now, when I pull on the thread, so I'm pulling on it, you can see, look at the needle. See how it's flexing? And when I mean flexing, it's moving. I'm just pulling it straight back. That to me is, is a good indicator um, initially if my thread tension is too loose or too tight up on top. So I like to pull on the thread let me just zoom in again, maybe not so tight. So I like to take, and I like to pull on the thread through the back 
and you'll see that needle. Can you guys see that needle moving? Maybe it needs to be zoomed in yep. a little more. I did see it when it was zoomed in. It was, it's flexing just maybe a millimeter or two. Yeah, very small amount, just like that. That's what I want. But if I pull on this thread and it doesn't flex at all, my tension's probably way too loose. If I pull on that thread and it flex and it, and it just, it flexes or it breaks the thread, that's what will sometimes happen. Then my tension is too tight. And your tension, we're gonna get into that next week, but your tension adjustment for your top tension is right here, okay? So we're gonna talk about tensions next week because we're gonna be able to, to really be in front of it and do some things with that. Any questions on threading the top of your machine? All right, we're doing great guys. So the next thing that I want to get into, I do want to talk about needles and uh, really quickly and, and maybe spend a little quick moment on thread. Um, I'm going to grab, I'm actually going to pull up on, on the screen, share my screen again and show you guys because there is, in here, They have at the bottom of one of these. I got to look and see which one. Okay. So on one that says TNT, TNT stands for tension, needles, and thread. So on this one at the very bottom, and this is, you guys, this really is just a suggestion. It's not, you know, you can't always go by it, but it shows you kind of what they recommend for certain threads and fabrics. Or sorry, not fabrics, uh, threads. I can tell you, you're probably going to use a 16 and 18 most of the time, almost all the time. And I find I prefer a 16, but a 16 doesn't always work, doesn't always do the trick. So you have to go to a bigger needle. When you guys see the number 100 next to it, that means, um, so it, basically it's like uh, imperial metric. So the first number that 16 is what they use, I don't know which one's where. I know I know a 16 is 100 and I know 18 is a 110 because in Europe they use one measuring system and in the States they used to use another. Well, now in the States and in Europe, they just put both numbers on there. So when you're buying needles, you'll always see those on there, all right? But a 16 or an 18 is what you're gonna work with the most. Once we kind of get past a 16 and an 18, this also in here, it shows that what I talked about, the groove, the shaft, this is the scarf. That's the backside of it. And it shows how that works inside here. It talks about how the tension is going to form. So there's really, um, in needles, so there's a couple things that, that we have to think about. So with your needles, you're going to have, uh, there's high speed needles now. So if you do a lot of what they call micro uh, quilting, that's really small, dense, fast movement quilting, you're going to want a high speed needle because when you're doing that, your needle's going really, really, really fast in there. So a high speed needle. There's um, your sharp needle, which is just your regular quilting needle. So when you buy a handy quilter, there's going to be either you're going to have just your sharp needles, you're going to have um, your high speed needles, and then you're going to have ballpoint needles. A lot of people say, why would I use a ballpoint? Uh, you're going to follow the same rules that you were. Some of you come from the sewing background. A lot of us do. And when you're sewing on anything that has stretch, you use a ballpoint needle. It's the same thing when you're quilting. So some of us say, well, what, what, when would we ever sew on anything that has stretch? Minky has stretch. And I absolutely love to use Minky as a backing. The quilting looks awesome. Um, obviously, the, the, the feel of the Minky is pretty fantastic when it's all said and done. It drapes really well. So we use Minky a lot. Um, if you're using that primarily, on, if you're using that on the top and the back, then you definitely are going to want to go with the ballpoint. If you're using it only on the backing, then usually you're going to want to use on your top. You're just going to you just use your regular sharp 
um, if you have a quilt, uh, cotton on top, all right? But having the wrong needle can cause skip stitches and it can cause thread breaks. So just the wrong type of needle can do that. Having the wrong size of needle can cause the exact same things. So as you guys are experimenting with different things at home, um, just understand that I'm a, I'm a resource for you. You guys all have my email address. So uh, it's eric, E-R-I-C, at Nuttall with two T's and two L's. So eric at nuttallbernina.com. And that's the email address that I sent the Zoom link out through. So you guys should have that to work with. And, you know, sometimes depending on what's going on, it, it might be really instant. It might be a day or two. Uh, to give you an idea, I did two classes yesterday, started at 12 o'clock and ended at 930 at night. So there's there's just just depends on what's going on as far as how soon I can get back to you. But we're a resource. We can help you figure these things out. And we we again, we use a lot of technology to do that so we can see what you're working with. So going back to it, needles and thread. Um, I don't like to get into the discussion of weight of thread because I've talked to too many manufacturers that deal with weights of thread. And uh, I read one of the best articles ever written. And this was a long time ago, but uh, the Sulky company wrote it. It's three pages long about how to determine the weight of a thread. How do companies determine this and that and all that? And then at the end of it, it basically said, find what works for you because there is no standard to weight and there's not a standard. And I've, I've, I've listened in rooms with the manufacturers. These are the people that make the product argue back and forth about how they determined their weight of thread. So my suggestion is it's a good starting point. Is somebody else's 40 weight the same as somebody else's 40 weight? Not necessarily. It depends on the way that they're choosing to calculate it. Somebody will say, well, I take X amount and we go this far and we weigh it. That the yardage, and that tells us the weight of thread. Okay, well, when you then produce the thread, did you use, was it a three-ply or was it a two-ply thread? Because you can have two 40 weights and one could be a two-ply thread and one could be a three-ply thread and one's going to have a thicker diameter. So you got to be, I, I wouldn't get hung up in that. Um, didn't want to get too far off track, but I, I just think find what works for you and just make the adjustments. And the adjustments are not always finite. That, does, that means that they're not always going to be the same. You're gonna to learn to adjust your tension on here. You're going to learn to adjust your tension in the bobbin case. And that's different because as sewers, you know, a lot of us were taught growing up, never touch the tension, especially in the bobbin case. And now we're trying to tell you something completely different. So I get it, it's, it's a learning curve, but trust me, it's gonna work and it's gonna work out. All right, so, um, we talked about sizes of needles. So as you go up in size, that's going to change the diameter of the needle. And sometimes, a lot of times, the eye will also get a little bit larger. The scarf, that or that, sorry, the groove that's running down the front of that needle. It's got to be your, sometimes we think, well, our needle needs to match our fabric. Yeah, sure, in some cases. But more importantly, your needle needs to match your thread. And what I mean by that is maybe you're working on a denim quilt. So you're going to use a really big needle, but then you're using a super thin thread. Well, you might find that you're going to have to change and go to a smaller needle, even though you're on a, a, a thicker fabric. So your thread has to be able to, this is just a rule, very few rules, um, but this is one of them. Your thread has to be able to sit inside that front groove. If it doesn't sit inside there, if your thread is thicker than that groove, then what happens is you, uh, when the needle goes down in the fabric and on its return out, that thread sitting outside that groove is now creating a loop on the front because of the friction and on the back. And you don't want that because when your hook comes around to grab your thread, you can't have a loop on the front and a loop on the back of the needle. Okay, so your thread has to sit down the shaft, it's got to sit inside that groove on there. So that's really quickly um, on needles. Do, does anyone have questions regarding needles or thread or anything of that nature? No, that's usually where we get the most. So again, I think a lot of it is you got to explore and you got to play. 
And to, uh, I, I keep saying tomorrow or wanting to say tomorrow, but it's uh, next week, same time. Um, we're going to be stitching and we're going to be showing good tension and bad tension and how do we solve it and all of those things. So that comes next week. The next thing I want to do now that we've covered threading and we've covered your bobbin is I want to cover loading the quilts. And everyone, there's lots of ways to do it. You'd be surprised how many ways there are to load a quilt. I'm going to show you um, maybe more of, let's call it the handy quilter way, because that's that's kind of what they show us and how they they have us do it. And then I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, some of the things that I do. We I, I don't necessarily do it the way I'm going to show you. Uh, I think it just depends on what you're comfortable with. I like to float, which is a different term. And I'll, later you'll see what floating is. But um, for now, we're going to get in and we're going to we're going to load a quilt on here. So I'm going to put the bars back on because they are currently off on the machine. So I'm going to put them back on. Um, there's a couple cool things. I don't know if you guys are going to be able to see this because I'm my camera can't zoom that far back out, but so over here on the sides on, this is the gallery two frame. Now, some of you may want something similar. And if you, if you have questions about your frame individually and you guys can see over to the left on here, this is the, the moxie frame. So a little bit different. And on the moxie frame, you guys, you, when you were doing your install, you got to choose how you wanted these to be set up. So some of yours is gonna look just like this. Some of them are gonna look a little bit different because you can choose um, the type of setup that you wanted to have on there. But on the side here, I'm just gonna put these in really quickly. But one thing that is available that you guys can get if you don't have these, this is on the gallery two frame, it comes with these. These are really cool and later I'll show you because you can use them to hold a bar. So you can move a bar out of the way. So let's say you wanna, you wanna fix your batting. You can pull one of your rails or one of your bars out and lift it up and put it up onto there while you uh, clean up your, the, the batting that's on there. I'm gonna take my rail. I'm gonna put this baby on. I'm gonna go over to each side and get it where it's supposed to be. Hopefully there's no big bangs or crashes in this process. So I did one side. And my other side is in place over here. I'm going to do the same with the next rail. And then I'm going to show you something that I'm going to recommend pretty strongly. And you guys are going to, again, you're going to be the deciders of if you want to do this or not. Or if you want to do your own thing. Is and the other good side over here. Uh, uh, where you're mounting the rails, is the other side look exactly the same? It does on this one here. So if we look over here. Now, your guys, if you're on the Amara, you have a studio frame, which is different. Right. But yeah, it's the same on the other side. Will that come out? Will what come out? Will the bar come out of the studio frame? Yeah. I mean, can you adjust it like you just did? Uh, you can oh. You can do that. You can take the bars out. Oh. Yep. I can see how the bottom one, the, the belly bar, but, but not the top one. I yeah, can't. the top one, you've got to move. Um, you should... Take a look at your frame, but I don't have the Studio 2 right here, but it should be on here. Maybe these are locked in. Unlock them, and then you should be able to just lift. Oh, okay. I see. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Now, the Studio isn't going to have, so if you guys, I'm going to switch this because that's kind of a hard view, at least looks hard for me. So in here, the Studio is not, actually, I have to be over here. Sorry. Hopefully everybody's all right. So the studio is not going to have this where it has. So you have a, uh, a lock for the, the lower one right here. But then on, on the, the gallery two, there's a lock that goes this way. And then there's also a lock that goes this way. And the reason why you guys is on the gallery two frame, we can change this um, to be a regular view or wide view. I forget the names that they call it. I'll show you both. But this whole mechanism, this is what's kind of cool on the gallery two frame. I can take this whole mechanism, lift it up, slide it forward, and lock it into place. And when we do that, it actually changes the way we load the fabric. So I'll show you guys that in a minute. I'm going to do this over here. So right now, this is set lower. So if I were to adjust this, 
this is, I'm going to adjust this to standard. So this coming up and over is now standard. So what that means is on here, hopefully we don't get too confused by any of this. What that means is on here, when I do it this way, my backing would be on this bar, my front bar. Okay. So my backing would go on my front bar, then my batting, and then my top would come through here in this scenario. If I were to change it to how I had it before, I'm gonna do it. So I'm gonna adjust this side down. When I adjust this, and I angle it down, that now changes. Now my backing is gonna go on this rail, and then my batting, and then my top is gonna to come up over the top and into um, the take up. I'm gonna to go to standard, we're gonna load a standard frame, and then I can explain the other and, and help you guys figure that out next. All right, first thing that I want you guys to do is notice on my bars that I have on here, we go in and we put a mark. So we measure and we find the center point. Now you should be able to measure, depending on your frame, your size of frame, everything's a little bit different, but this is where they couple together. This is where it hooks together. This is also where it hooked together again. And so on here, this one is a 12 foot frame. So we have three, four foot sections. So I just took the center section and we marked the center of it. And if you look on here, we have the exact same thing right here. And if you look up in here, most people don't mark this one, but you can, it's a dead bar. I have that one marked as well, right here. And then let me unlock this. This guy is marked as well, right here. All right. So if you're going to use my method of loading your frame, then you're, gone, you're going to want to do those marks that are on there. So the first thing that, that we're going to do is I'm going to take, I'm going to grab my leader cloth. So my big long leader, I've got a big long one in the back, but on here, and you can get different sizes of leaders, you guys. I'm going to, I'm going to use one of the classes, depending on how far we go, to go in and talk about accessories and all those different things. All right. But for now, we're going to kind of just keep to the basics, get you guys started. So I'm going to take my leader cloth. So I've got my one leader here. I've got all my leaders, but I'm going to take my leader cloth. And we are going to go in and I am going to, this one's the narrow leader. This is my, my narrowest leader cloth. I'm gonna put it up on this bar here. And let me show you what I do first. So I take my leader cloth, fold it in half. So I fold my leader cloth in half. If my leader was too wide for my frame, I would cut it down, fold it in half, and then I mark it. And I don't just mark it on one side. I fold it in half and I mark it on the other side too, just a Sharpie, that's all we did, okay? So with that marked, now what I'm going to do, I've got to engage this to go the right direction. Yeah, that should be it. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, got my mark, and I've got my mark on here. So I am going to line those up. So we're just going to line up the marks on here. So I've got my fabric. There's my mark, there's my mark. I hook the Velcro to it. And now I'm gonna do that all the way down. I'm just gonna Velcro that all the way left and right. Okay, so I'm gonna take this and I'm going to continue. I'm gonna to try to stay out of your view, but I'm just gonna hook this all the way down. Now, some people take their leaders off 
and they stitch. They use their sewing machine and they baste their quilt to their leader. You can do that. And then that way when they come up, they don't have to do all the pinning that I'm going to do. So that one's on there and I'm gonna do it and take it down to the other side now. And again, I'm just hooking this in. So now I know that this leader is on and it's centered. So that leader is centered. We're gonna do the same thing on our next leader. All right? So now we're gonna go in, grab my leader cloth. I've already marked it. So I've got my marks and you, you mark both sides, by the way. And now, so what I do is I also engage this, you guys. This is a, a little pro tip, I guess. Engage your, your ratchets on here. I engage the other ratchet, the back one on this frame. This one is, is not used when we're going in this direction. So what this does is it allows me, and actually, before I go too far, that's not the right way. So I need to engage this one. That's the right ratchet for, for this frame. If you don't have a gallery two frame, you're not gonna have to, you, that's not a thing. Or if you don't have that, so you can change that, that quick setup. On here, I have it engaged. So now that it's engaged, when I go to rotate the fabric, it's gonna roll the correct direction. So now I've got this guy on here. I'm gonna line up my marks, just like I did last time. And we're just gonna take, and we're gonna move it all the way across the frame, okay? So now I'm gonna, ooh, not do that. So now we're just gonna take this, and we're gonna take it, and we're gonna go all the way across the frame. Now, one thing that I know is this is facing the right direction right now because I can see Handy Quilter. And if this is my top fabric, which is how I have the frame set up, this is how I'd want it to be. If I were to rotate this right now, this is showing me exactly how I'd want my backing to be. And if you look, so I'll zoom in. So what I mean by that is, Let's look at the top fabric. I'm gonna move it over here so it's not as to confuse you. So I don't have the backing, I don't have my leader cloth on this one yet. So my top, this is exactly how I want it to feed into the machine from this rail. So I need my, when I pin my fabric onto here, it's gotta be right side up. Okay, right side up. The backing is what I'm putting on now putting on the, the uh, leader cloth for the backing. And so when I put the backing on, it's also showing me, I'm gonna um, move this back to where it was before. So I'm gonna, I went from centers out and my backing, the way that I do it, is my backing is also now showing me how the fabric needs to go on. Because when you put your backing on, which is what we're gonna do first, the right side of the fabric has to be facing down, okay? So this is my backing that I'm putting on here. Um, I can take this now and I can rotate it. And I know that it's the right way because if I were to lift this up, you notice you can't see Handy Quilter. You could if I flip it, but it's showing me that the right side is going to be down. So now, here's what we do next. I'm gonna move, move my machine out of the way. And before I go too far, I wanna, I wanna also give you guys some more um, ideas on what you should be doing as far as maintenance goes, okay? Your rails, so down inside here is your track. You guys are gonna wanna take, you can even just take batting. It could be just a piece of batting. I'll rip one off. 
So I could just take even a piece of batting. And you would want it, you don't want to use chemicals on it because there's plastic and you can cause damage to the plastic. But I'm gonna I'm gonna move these because I should have shown you this earlier. And these are definitely in the way. So I'm gonna just pull these off again. Come on. I'll get these out of the way so I can show you what I mean. Eric, I think you need me to come be a cameraman, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> the cameraman. <laughs> Tell you what, I'll tell you, it's oh, a you're doing easier. a great job, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. It's a little easier when it's uh when we're dealing with uh not the 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 space that we're dealing with on here. Okay, so down inside here, you guys, these are the tracks that I'm talking about. So on here, you're gonna want to go in and just clean these off, and you can just take you know some water and put it on there a little bit and just wipe these down, because what's gonna happen is you're gonna collect dust and lint all over these tracks. And that's the there's metal another track part, not What's the that? Plat that's the metal part not the blue plastic part because then you know the blue so so the blue plastic part you're gonna look inside there and you're gonna just clean this out if there's things that get in the track because this is if you have a pro stitcher this is what operates the pro stitcher okay you so you're gonna clean so you definitely want to inspect that and see but on here you're just gonna clean this off and then there's the exact same track. I'm not going to move the bars, but there's the exact same track on the back side that you'd want to clean those off. The other thing you want to do is inspect these every once in a while. If you got little digs in here, like there's a little groove that's cut into there, it's going to show up in your quilting because you're going to have a wobble wherever it hits that. These can be replaced. You can get replacement parts for that. Um, you don't have to really put, replace them very often, but if you needed to, uh, it's available. The next thing that you'd want to do, let's just move this out of the way for a second. The next thing that you'd want to do is do the same thing on here. You're going to clean this off. Now, I'll tell you where I find to be uh, the biggest issue, problem area is, let's move this guy over for a second. So there's a couple places, you guys. One of them is the wheels that are moving vertically, so front to back, those wheels. So you'll look at these and you'll find thread and junk that gets into these wheels. These are pretty clean. I wish they weren't so I could show you, but you'll find it on there. So the same thing, just take something, a little bit of batting, and I'm just moving the machine front to back and cleaning those out, all right? So you'll find that there's stuff on there. And then the next part, I'm gonna slide this over, see if we can get you into a decent view of these little, little guys. But underneath here, there's the wheels that are underneath. So I'm gonna zoom out so you can see what that is. So underneath the carriage, there's actually four wheels on the, on the front and four wheels on the back. There's one here, and there's one here. And then you have the same thing on that other side. And then you have the same thing in the back. So same thing, you wanna clean these off. These, I see all the time, they just get uh, like levels of, of, of dust that build up on that wheel. And then your, your machine doesn't have the smooth action that you always want it to have. So definitely take the time, you guys, you know, even if it's once every couple of weeks or so, take the time to do that maintenance because it's gonna make a difference and it's gonna show up in your quilting if you don't do that, okay? So let's get back to loading. And again, no, no harsh chemicals on there. It, it, that's not required. Does anyone have questions on what I just talked about as far as that goes? Pretty easy, okay. So let me get the bars back on really fast. Put those puppies where they need to go. And One side and 
When you put your bars in, make sure that the wheels are locked in place. You gotta have it the right way. Okay, and then number two. Okay, so back to what we were working with before. The first thing that I would do is I'm gonna take my machine, I'm gonna slide it out of the way. So I'm gonna move all the way to one side of the table. And then I'm going to go, you guys, and I'm gonna grab my backing fabric. So I'm gonna do that really quick. And this is what I have for my backing. Oh, got a lot going all over on me. Okay, so I've got my backing. So what I'm going to do with my backing is I'm going to now take my backing. I'm not sure uh, what they gave me to work with. Let me look and just see if they gave me a lot width-wise or what. Yeah, they did. Okay. So I'm going to take this and I'm gonna spread it out this direction. So I'm gonna go with my backing and I'm gonna find the center spot. And I'm gonna find it in both places, top and bottom, okay? A lot of people don't necessarily do both. They find one and then they, they don't realize it's a good idea to find the top on the other side, the middle on the other side. So I take my, back, my backing, I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna fold it in half and I'm gonna find my center spot, okay? So here's my center spot over here where the fold is. And I am going to take a safety pin and I am going to put that safety pin in. And the reason that I'm using a safety pin, you guys, is instead of a straight pin is Safety pin is is it this this particular part is going to come out, and I don't want this to come off when I'm loading because now I'll lose my center spot. So I'm marking the center on one side. So the center is now marked on one side, and then I told you you've got to do it on the other side as well, right? And you're going to have a much bigger piece to deal with than I am but we're gonna take and we're gonna do the same thing over here. Now, if you have a piece backing, which I think a lot of you are gonna end up with a, you know, your backing is gonna be pieced at some point. What's gonna happen is if you have a pieced backing, you're gonna to wanna to run, you're gonna want that where it's pieced to run horizontally across here. You're not gonna want to piece it and put that piece where it's pieced vertically down that center channel. For one, you're gonna be stretching it across here and you're always throughout the entire quilt, you're gonna be dealing with going over that thickness over and over and over every pass that you make. If you piece your backing together and you put it on so it can be horizontally placed on here, you're only dealing with where it's been pieced once. And that's the one pass that you're going to make through there. So we're going to take this. Is that, did everybody follow what I was just talking about there? Maybe. Guys still awake? Yes, we're still awake. <laughs> All right. But I, I got have one a question. <laughs> yeah. When does it affect, like sometimes I'll piece my backings and have them pieced in several places and one will be the vertical and what vertically. Will yeah. that affect um, the winding of the quilts onto the tape cut bar and affect the uh, tension? It doesn't, it, 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 can, it can affect the tension a little bit. It doesn't affect the winding of it so much. Now, huh. um, we're talking in ideal situations, right? When we have control over this, but sometimes <laughs> that's just the way the backing is. Yeah, and so if if it's pieced down the center, and or it's pieced in multiple spots, that's what you're working with, and that's okay. I'm just so you're, you're going to be fine. You just have to be understand that that area is going to be there to deal with the right. whole time that you're quilting. And as long as you know okay. that and, and understand that 
when you get into all of a sudden inconsistencies, right? The goal is to keep everything consistent because if right. you can keep everything consistent, your quilting stays consistent. But let's, let's talk real world for a second. Piecing is not consistent. It's not always consistent. Mm -hmm. And so definitely on the front, there's nothing you can do. It's pieced all over and there's all these seams. So my, my only, my only uh, suggestion would be when it's possible, try to keep that, that seam um, horizontal. Okay. Thank you. Yes. You okay. So I've got, I've got my pins in and I mark my center. So again, this is my backing. So what I do, you guys, is I take my fabric and I say, all right, how do I, how does this need to actually be um, when I take it off of the frame? Well, if this was a quilt or a blanket or whatever, it's going to be a quilt. We won't call it a blanket, but I would take and I would need the back facing down, right? So I just throw it all over the top with my back of my fabric facing the floor. Everybody with me? That's how you would have this is if this was an actual quilt, which it's going to be um, on here. So with that said, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come up to this front rail. Now, there's two ways that you, that on the Moxie, you can set yours up to where this is the backing rail or this is your um, top rail. It all depends on the side, how you set those up in the instructions. So I'm going to show both methods so everybody's understanding how this works. Okay. So what I would do is I would then go into here and I would take this and I would line up right here. I've got my mark. So I'm going to line up my mark with my center of my, my pin. So when we zoom in, you'll see that. And then I use my straight pins after that. So there it is. There's our safety pin. And I'm going to grab my straight pins because they're here somewhere. So if you've got like a, a you know, a pin cushion to put those onto, that's great. So I'm going to take my pins and now I'm going to get my first one in. So it's lined up. You can see my safety pin is there. So I'm going to get my first one just lined up. Safety pin and my mark. They're both right there. I'm going to mark, I'm going to get that one locked in. So I've got a pin on the side of that. And once that pin is in place, I can now take out the safety pin. So the safety pin is going to come out. I then go in and I pin all the way across the quilt. I pin all the way to the left and I pin all the way to the right. So that's what we're going to do first. We're going to pin all the way down this left side. And some people say you have to go head to toe on the pins. I don't do that. I leave a little bit of space in between them. I don't leave too much of a gap, but I'm going to come into here. Now I'm on the wrong side to do this. So I'll go on the other side. But all I'm going to do is pin this all the way down. Okay. But now, one thing that you may want to look at once you get this kind of started. So I just started to, to get that pinned. What I would do next is just to verify, because I, I only, and you want to do it now, because I only have the two pins that are in here. So I've got my, my, uh, Right there is my center point, okay? So my center point, I'm now going to take, and this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go off that center point and I'm going to just measure on here all the way out to this edge. So I'm measuring from center, so from the center point, I'm gonna take and I'm gonna measure from the center out. So I'm gonna go into here and I'm just gonna measure across as I'm bringing this and I'm gonna get my measurement. So my measurement is showing right now when I come all the way out to 
to the edge. It's sitting right about 50, a little over uh, 54 and a half inches. Before I go too far, I am now going to measure from center out to the other side. And we are going to verify that we are also going to get 54 inches. Okay? So when I come into here, I'm going to go center out. And I am at 54. The other one must have been 54 and a half. Is that right? Because this one's 54 and a half. Said 54 inches, but now I'm second guessing. Yep, 54 and a half. So 54 and a half both ways. So now I know I'm I'm as I'm as exactly in the center as I need to be. And some people will even take and they will pin that side. Let's say it's on this this first side. Once they get started, some people will go and they'll they'll drop a pin over here. So they'll kind of take their leader cloth and they'll just get it into here and they'll drop a pin and this edge and then they'll work their way out back towards it. And the idea is that way they're not forcing their or stretching their quilt. They're backing across. Now on this one, a lot of times you weave it multiple, get it through there as many times as you can, just weaving that pin in and out. And that's going to secure this side in here. And from now, so now I'm going to go in and I'm going to pin all the way across this way and all the way across on that other side. So that's going to be my next little move in here. Now, some of you are going to just go in and you're going to, you're going to stitch that in. So that means you're going to take it on your home sewing machine. You're going to pull the leader off and you're going to baste it. Um, with your sewing machine and then walk it over and you're going to hook it back in with the Velcro. You now everybody, everybody has their, their way of doing things, whatever works for you. And so I'm going to just going to cruise through this. And a big part of this is let's not try to stretch our fabric as we do this. So we don't want to stretch our fabric, um, as we're pinning. Does anyone have suggestions as to what they like to do? Because there's lots of ways to do it. And I do think that's an important uh, point to bring up right now. Everything that I'm going to teach you guys uh, in this class, it's it's the way that that I do it. It's the way that a lot of people do it, I guess. But it's definitely the way that I do things. Um, but it's not the only way. So if there's something that works for you, and it's it's consistent, then I would say keep it up. Because that's really what you want out of this is you just want some real consistency. So on the Moxie, it works the exact same way. You're just going to do the same thing. And again, all this is just technique right now. Everything that we're doing is just our own technique. Yeah. All right, I got one more to put over here and I'll go the other way. Eric? Yes. This is Connie Collin. I have the moxie. How yeah. important is it that my leaders are not on straight? You know, like uh, one, in, one end's got more leader than the other end. It's, it's more important. You mean left to right, they're not on straight? Yeah, right at the ends, there's maybe three inches on one end and an inch on the other. Do I need to take those off and re-put them back on? No, I think the most important thing, Connie, is mark the center pole because the pole is still the same no matter what. Okay. So mark the center pole and then mark your leaders in the center as well. Okay. 
And, and what that may mean is when you mark them in the center, yeah, it's probably going to be further on one side is what you're telling me anyway, because your leaders are bigger. Is that right? Yeah. So when it, only one of them is off. Let me try and follow this really quick. No, they're all four different. Okay. So all four of your center marks, this is the real key. All four of your center marks have to be the same. Okay. So you're all, I need... You're, because you're going to be working from the center out anyway. So think about this. So even if my even if my leader cloth was wider one direction or the other, yeah. If if the center of my pole, right, is marked to the center of the leader, when I come out 54 inches this way, it's still 54 inches. Now, I might have 7 extra inches of leader on this side. But I'm still only coming over 54, 54 and a half inches from the center, right? Yeah. And when I go that way, I'm still only going 54 and a half inches from the center. So as long as that's consistent, you could have more leader cloth over here. That's not going to be the, the biggest concern on there. But your leaders are your, your leaders are Velcro, right? So you're going to pull them off as long as the center is marked. So okay, I, think, I, I haven't done any of that. I, I haven't used it yet because I haven't learned how to use it. I think it's actually just your center that's going to be the concern. And once you mark the centers and you're lining up the centers and you folded your leaders in half, you're not going to, you, you, I'm not sure how you're going to end up with extra leader on one side. Well, this was just how it was assembled. I haven't okay. touched it because I don't know what oh. I'm doing. I'm well, just I, think you're going to be, I think you're going to be fine. I think once you mark your centers, then your leaders are going to be on in a different spot because you're now going to be basing it off the center point. So I think you're going to be just fine. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't stress on it. I think you're going to be, you're going to be happy. Thank you. You bet. Because your leaders are Velcro again, so they're going to come off. And the, the critical thing is mark the centers of all the poles to be center. So you're, you're getting true centers and then do the same on your leaders. And you shouldn't have actually extra anything if you do it that way. All right. So I'm just weaving you guys these pins in here. Now I didn't do what I what I suggested before, which is so before I go too far, we're just going to take this and we're going to measure it off over here and we would put a pin in on this side okay so i did measure it but i'm going to assume we're good normally that's where you would want to if you if you're going to do it that way you would put the pin in in here too and again that's 54 and a half on each now you're backing so this is a this is something to make sure you take note of or remember you're backing and you're batting they need to be at least at least three inches bigger, top, bottom, left, right. So three inches means six inches, really, because it's three inches on all ends. So six inches wider, six inches longer than your top. So then your quilt top itself. So we need you to have six inches. So three inches on the left, three inches on the right, three inches on top, three inches on bottom. Some people, like to go four inches. But what happens when you're quilting is your fabric is going to shift. It's going to move. And the last thing you want is for your backing and your batting to be the exact same size as your top. And believe me, believe it or not, your tops are not going to be perfectly square every time you put them on. You square them up at the end a lot of times. You're going to do the best you can is keeping them square. But last thing you want is for a little bit of your backing to be over here while your top is over here and offset, okay? So give yourself a little bit of wiggle room to work that top into place. It's also gonna grow in length somewhat, not really, I mean, it's gonna get, it could get, it could get stretched. So all of a sudden, if you started at, at your, your backing and your top at the same spot, by the time you get to the end, it could be that you're, based on just rolling the fabric and putting quilting into it, 
you could end up with your uh, top being longer than your backing. And nobody wants that. If your backing is longer or wider, it's going to be fine because you're going to square it off at the end. Okay. So this takes a while to do. This is the this is the not so fun part, I guess. Um, you know, I've learned that it's probably best to let one person do this. Uh, my wife and I, we have a long arm, and we don't do long arm quilting as a team. It's somebody somebody's going to do it, and that's going to be their thing when they're working on it. Because a lot of things can happen. Some of us could you know, pin different spacing, um, pull a little bit more than the other, and especially when we're rolling this. So now I'm just gonna take my fabric, you guys, and I'm gonna go in, and again, this isn't a wide enough angle, but I'm gonna take all that, and I'm gonna get it clean now. And what I mean by that is, I'm gonna get it laid out over the top of the this this bar in the back. So we're gonna just get it all laid across on both sides. So we're going to get it up onto there, and then we're going to start to roll. Okay. So I wanted, to, I needed to have. You want to have that in, locked in place. And what we're looking for now, you guys, what I would be looking for now is let's kind of look at this. Look how much higher this is over here than it is. Over here, you can see it kind of droops down right there. It kind of takes a dip down. So we got to lift that up because we got to get that to be a little bit more consistent with the other side. So there we go. So you want to, again, it's all about consistency. So when we're rolling this on, that's what I'm looking for. So now, if I was to pan across here, it's going to look really consistent going all the way from one side to the other. And so this is where I can now start to feel a little bit more comfortable where I need a wider angle camera. But now I can go in and I can start to roll this. And I'm just using that the, the fact that the fabric's sitting up over that as the kind of a tensioner. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come into here and we're just gonna kind of smooth this out and this is where if two people are on here doing this one of you might definitely be pushing a little bit harder and kind of not keeping this as square as you want it to be so the next thing that you're looking for as you're rolling this on here if your fabric is cut fairly square then you shouldn't end up with a, a big a big uh, pile of of fabric growing in one direction wider on either end. So you're just gonna keep going through and we're gonna keep rolling this. Take your time to get this right, you guys, because getting this right is really gonna be uh, what, what sets apart your quilting at the end of the day. And this is actually going on really nice and square. I don't have any extra fabric. So now it kind of went to the end. It naturally pulled over on its own, that's okay. And now I'm going to continue. And it's OK if this other one wants to roll um, or move the other rail. But you're just going to keep rolling on here. And you're going to keep smoothing this out. And so I'm just kind of going through here. There's a little bit of ease that I've got to put into this side. So I'm just moving it all out to here because that other side and this fabric wasn't cut so well on the one right side because I could see where there's a big jagged nick put into this. So I'm going to concentrate on the one side that definitely looks to be cut a little more square. And I'm just going to keep verifying that this side is lining up really great, which it is. We're going to keep rolling. So right side down. So my right side is down right now on the fabric. What I mean by that is, this is the right side of the fabric. It is facing down. That's how this is going to be for the standard setup. So when I roll that into there, that one's good on here. Notice what I didn't do. I didn't take out 
our little pin. See if I can find it. It's in there somewhere. But our little pin, there it is. Our safety pin. Because that is marking my center mark. Right? So I still have my center mark. Center mark for later use. So we're okay on that. I could also kind of look at it and verify, you know, how's it going to look with my center up here? Well, here's where this one is. Here's where that one is. Pretty darn close. So the next thing that we're going to do is we are going to go in. We're going to do the same thing. We are now going to do it with the top. Okay, so we know what way it has to go, it has to face up. So this is my top. And what I haven't done yet, I don't have another safety pin. I think I only brought two back here. Um, but we're going to go in, same thing. Now, is my backing going to be wider than my top? I have no idea because this is just what they had up here at the at the frame, they're probably the same size, but you, you wouldn't want that. You don't want your backing and your top the same. You want your backing three inches minimum wider on one side and then the, on the top as well, top and bottom. Safety pin, gonna drop that into here. And I should have brought another safety pin back here, but I'll use a straight pin, it's not my preferred method. So there's our safety pin in here. And I'm gonna use a straight pin on this side because the one that I throw to the back, that definitely I wanna have a safety pin in there because otherwise it could uh, just come out. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to do is we're gonna go into here. I'm going to mark the top of this. I'm getting dust, not dust, batting. Because this was already hooked on the frame and then they took it off the frame. So now I got batting all over me. The quilter's life. Okay. So I've got my center marked and I'm using a straight pin on this. So now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this. We're going to throw it over the top to the other side, right? On here. So we're just going to take this baby. We're going to toss it to the back. And the right side is going to be up this time. So right side's up. all the way to the back. And your quilts are gonna be probably different than this. <laughs> this is not your average. So we're gonna get that just kind of up over the top. And the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna now find, which is what we need to do, we're gonna go in and find our center spot, which is right here. So I've got my pin and my center spot. I'm gonna use that straight pin. I'm gonna go through this in the center and we're going to measure next out. So I'm just putting the pin in, sorry. So the pin is in, and now I'm going to measure from the center out. Going to also grab a couple more pins. I just take the pins and I throw them like right onto there. So like I'll just grab a couple pins that I've got, and you can just kind of throw them onto, onto that top. So as you're going, you got some pins to work with. Other people do it more efficiently, probably with the pin cushion on their hands or on their wrist. So I'm gonna measure out because 
we I didn't I don't know what these fabrics are. I didn't measure to see what the two were in comparison to each other. So we're gonna look and find out real quick on here. So I'm going from again, guys, we're going from the center and we're just measuring out. So our last one was 54 and a half, and this one is also 54, just under 54 and a half. So I'm going to put my pin in over here on this side. They're almost the exact same width. They're very close. And then we're going to pin from the center out. So I'm putting one just in the side and then we're going to pin from the center out. Okay. So although this is kind of boring to go through, this really is pretty crucial. Getting your quilt on there makes a big difference, getting it on there the right way. Uh, I told you I usually float and that means at this point I wouldn't actually be pinning my top fabric. So when you float, your fabric, floating is a technique. And what that means is you're going to pin your backing and get it all set up, but your top fabric is going to just be pinned only to the take up rail. And even then, maybe it's not pinned. Maybe you just basted it onto there. Does anyone have a preference on floating or non floating? Anyone tried it? Not yet. Floating, floating is hard. Floating is hard. That's that's what my granny says. I believe. Her. <laughs> I feel like yeah. I have no control of my quilt top if I float it. Okay. And I always. That's it. I always float. Yeah. I like floating the best. We got a pro in here. Cool. Yeah. Well, so what happens is it, it really is very personal as to what works best for you. I'm and I'll show you guys what I do when we float. Um, because I have I have the the experience with floating of the opposite where I feel more in control, and you know it's again it's preference because I have other quilters they don't float anything ever, and for that exact same reason they feel like they have less control. So we'll show you the technique, and then, you know, at least technology isn't there today to where I get to sit and watch everybody doing things from my perch on high so you guys can do whatever you want i'm not going to be there i won't know okay we're almost there on this side so this is me not floating of course I'm um, short one pin. I was close. Close on my count. Okay, so now I'm going to do the same thing going back the other way. We're going to take a pin with us because we're going to measure. So now I'm going to go from the other direction towards this way. We're just going from the centers out. Perfect. Just under 54 and a half. So now I'm going to pin this side in, move back to the center, and come from the center out.
All right. So I'm just dropping a few pins into here. And that's that's all I'm doing, guys. I just have pins that I just dropped right into here. And then I'm going to take these guys and go from the center out. I think next time I'm going to take another camera and put it on that side facing me because sure it's awkward for you and it's awkward for me to not be facing you guys but we live and learn we hopefully do those two things As we come across, we're almost to that edge. And then we're almost to the, the, well, we are getting to the final stages for sure. I am just off on my count by one. I'm one short again. Got two left and I'm going to need a third. I must be out of practice. Haven't been, haven't been doing enough quilts lately. Too many other things. Yes. So that brings me you're to something that. What, what's that? So you were, you're still way faster than me. I tried that for the first <laughs> time two days ago or something. Yeah. It takes some. Yeah, it gets, it gets so to be I, some work, right? Oh, yeah. I'm amazed at how much uh, skill this stuff takes. It's no joke. Well, and, and that's the one thing that's, that is almost unfortunately lost on somebody who receives a quilt when they don't realize all the stuff that goes into making that that beautiful piece of art all, all the hours it takes hours yeah it absolutely That's absolutely nice. we were just calculating how much uh it would cost for a basic quilt and and yeah people do not realize how no. valuable it really have is no idea it's a heck of a skill Oh, absolutely. So we have coming up one thing that I should mention, because um, my wife and I just got back from, well, we did Bernina's convention. Um, actually, we did Handy Quilters first. And then we did Bernina's. And then we went to, um, after we did Bernina's convention, we went and did Brothers. And then we've got Baby Locks coming up. Um, at the end of this month. So we're doing a, we always do this every year. We do what's new from convention. So it's called, it's just what's new event. You can go onto our website, which is nuttlebernina.com. And it's nuttle, not nuttles, just nuttle, two T's, two L's. So nuttlebernina.com. And you can uh, look at the different dates because we do it in each of the locations. And it's, it's no charge, but what we do is we show you all the, the new products that are coming out. Um, and it's some of the products you won't see until next year. Uh, they're slated for early 2023, but it's kind of fun to come and see some of the new things that are, that are available and, you know, just kind of keep updated with the, with your craft. Okay. So we've got this on here. It rolled on pretty straight now. One thing that I will tell you that is an advantage, and actually, look at this, you guys. You guys can't see it. I'll just zoom in because that, that's fantastic. So if we look into here, those are our safety pins. So we got both of those lining right up to one another. Okay? So... Moving on to the next. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take our backing. And your backing, I always do the backing first. It doesn't matter which style of frame that we're, we're working on. I always do the backing first. So now we're going to take our backing, which is this guy here. It is going to go underneath. So it's going underneath this rail. And one thing that's cool about this particular system, you guys, is that rail, if it's in your way, 
you can lift it up and put it onto this little holder. So over here, I can lift this up and move it out of the way. So I have that big space underneath. And those are available to be added to other frames. So if it's something that you like, so now I have all that extra, so I just did it on both sides. So now I have that extra space underneath here to, to work around, all right? So now we're gonna take our, our backing and it is going to go under here and it's gonna go your, your uh, take up bar, which is this back one. There is a, a dead bar, which is underneath it. So your fabric then comes. Hello, I'm just, move. just a quick gonna, question. You say that those, um, Things on the ends can be used yep. on all the different frames. Not on the Moxie, but they can be used on the, the Amara frames, the Studio okay, 2s. thank you. So I moved it off just for viewing purposes. So you guys can see it a little bit easier. But now we're going to take this guy that was never really rolled on correctly. I just had it up there. And we're going to take it. And remember, I have that one marked as well. So there's the center mark right there. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to take our backing. We're going to take the, uh, grab my pin. So we're gonna take our backing and now we are going to go in and we're going to line up our center piece, which is the safety pin with our center up on here. And so I'm gonna grab the fabric and we're going to line those up and then we're going to pin them across. That's gonna help keep this square, you guys. So now I've got that pin in there. I can take this guy, the safety pin out. And we could do the same thing. We would measure across. I'm, I'm just gonna hurry, I'm just gonna hurry and pin because I think you guys get the point, but I could go into here, I could measure center out, measure center out and pin the other directions, right? Put a pin on each end, just like we said before. Um, I'm not gonna measure, I'm still gonna put a pin over there, but I'm not gonna bother with the measuring. And here's one thing that's really cool. When you guys, one thing when you're loading, like I just have plain fabric, but when you're loading your quilts and you've got those piece tops, you're gonna have very direct lines, meaning straight lines, as you're rolling those onto here, your backing may not be, but your top is, as you're rolling that forward, uh, take into account, just do a, a visual inspection. Are those straight piece lines, are they going, rolling onto this bar equally? If not, then you might need to take in and make a little bit of an adjustment as you're going onto there. Okay, so let's get this on and get this show on the road. Eric, this is Becky. Hi. Um, can you show me or show us again how you have the backing and the leader um, against each other? You have it sandwiched. So the, the leader is towards the back, correct? And which side are you going to put the pins on when you pin them together? On, on the backing? Yeah, when you put the, the backing against the leader from the take-up bar. So the, what I'm doing right now? Yeah, can you show a close-up yeah. of that? Just Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. So what, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this. So I'm going to take this guy here, which is my take-up leader. I'm going to take my backing. I'm going to line those two edges up just like that. And I'm going to pin it in through here and I'm going to weave that pin in. Perfect. Thank you. You bet. And then, so I would do that all the way down. So I will do that and down one direction, then down the other, right? And can't really throw the pins onto this one because there's nothing holding it now. So I just kind of put some in there. But yeah, I'll just continue all the way down this guy.
And I just weave the pins in, guys, as I'm going. And I try really hard not to stretch the fabric because it's easy to do that. And especially if you're working with Minky. So my cousin, she's the head golf coach for the women's uh, team at Tulsa. So the University of Tulsa. And for her seniors, she makes a quilt. So she makes it and then she gives it to them. But she had she had has me quilt it. And then I also do a I applique with my long arm. I applique Tulsa's logo with Minky on it. And it, it looks really, really awesome. Anyway, uh, we had Minky uh, as the backing. She she likes to put the Minky as the backing. And you know, you just have to learn how to work with it and just know not to stretch it as you go. But man, I love how it turned out. Just awesome. And of course, she loved it. She was super thrilled. I might be getting getting worse at this. I'm too short this time. All right, actually I'm not, I'm only one. I'm still, I'm still, I'm still, still in the game. One off. All right. So I would do that and then I'd go the other direction. I would, I would measure first, right guys? We talked about that. So I would I would now measure that way, and I guess zoom back out. So I I would measure, make sure that I'm still square going on this direction. Measure it, pop the pin in on the on the other side, come back to the middle, and start to start to pin. So we measured. We're going to pretend. Yep, it's perfect. Now I'm pinning and I'm coming back the other direction. So that's in there, and now I can come back this other way. I might need more pins to keep going. Have any of you guys done uh, quilted with Minky as the backing? I'm doing a small Minky quilt right now. It's lower pile, but it's beautiful. It's it's going very well. Awesome. Yeah, I I'm, love it. Uh, go ahead. I'm backing quilts now, and Minky is not my favorite. I love the feel <laughs> of it, but I hate quilting it. You hate quilting it? What happens? Just so I, have, so I have an idea. Just too much fuzz from it. Yeah. There is that. That that can happen. A lot of certain times brands, when you cut it, it just starts instantly. Other brands, not so much. Yep. I was just going to say, what I found is Shannon Fabrics. That's the minky that we pretty much exclusively buy for that reason. So we we pretty much do Shannon uh, cuddle. They have quality wise, they're, in my opinion, they're easily the best quality. They're more expensive, but not by much. You're not paying a lot more for it. And and what you are paying for maybe on the front end, you're paying on the, that cheaper fabric on the other end, right? Exactly. Okay. So we got that one in. So we're ready. I'm going to just take that and we're going to. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to my hand wheel over here on the right side. And we're just going to work that through. Now, on the Moxie, you don't have a hand wheel like this, but you have the rail. So you just go into there. You always want to engage this guy just so you're just to make sure that you're you're uh, rolling it in the right direction. So as we get that in there, I'm just gonna roll this up and kind of get it up towards 
maybe eh, maybe eight inches or so from the top on there. And now we've got our backing on here. And something that I'm finding out right now, and I'm glad that I know this now, is if I look at this, you guys, and you can't see it the way that this is, so let me just show you. This fabric was definitely not square coming in. So the nice thing is I can make my adjustment. That's the right side, but watch as I move from the right to the left. Look how it just wants to sag all the way down. So what I'm going I, to do, go ahead. I noticed that before you panned around. I know it looks yeah. a little off. Yeah, it's well, and it's not cut straight for sure. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to make that adjustment right now by just going through and recycling these pins to where this is now going to be sitting more at the right level. So I'm gonna have fabric, extra fabric up on top of that other side, okay? So there's gonna be a little bit more fabric sticking up over this other edge. So I'm still just reaching through, finding that the, the leader. So I'm popping it through that leader and coming through here, but now I'm gonna have a little bit, like I say, just a little bit of fabric that's, that's kind of pulled up through there. Now, if I was measuring it left and right, which we which we expected you to do, then we're very comfortable just knowing that this side really is just cut longer in length. So we're still we're still going to be square when it's all said and done. I have two questions on leaders. Um, yeah. One is, um, does it is it beneficial to have leaders of different sizes for different quilts? Because I've heard that if you use just one size, but you're altering constantly, you can stretch out an area. And how frequently should you change out leaders because of getting stretched? Uh, that's a really interesting question. That's one I've never had before. I'm gonna have to ask some other people their opinions on that. Um, because my opinion, my the leaders that we're working with, I've not, I mean, I've had the same machine for 10 years, same leaders. So I haven't had that issue. Um, there are different sizes of leaders. So some people will get a super leader, which, which we can pull up and show you on there. That's a longer leader that comes forward more. I like that because you're not having to reach over as far to get to your fabric. But as far as needing multiple sets, the only reason I, uh, the only thing that I could think of minus that possible stretching, because I've not ever heard of that yet. I'm not saying it's never happened, but um, I do have some, some clients that have multiple leaders because they have multiple quilts that they're putting on and off the frame at, uh, at a, any given time. So they want to have multiple leaders so they could take, and if they're sometimes, especially when they're doing, if you have somebody like I do a lot of more automate work with automation, but if you, if you're going to do custom quilting, there's times where you just kind of fall into a, maybe a little bit of a, a creative block and you just want to get a quilt off for a second, or maybe you quilt for a living, a lot of that. And so what you want to do is you want to, you got to get a quilt off so you can get another one on and finished in a time frame. So I have people that have multiple leaders for those reasons. And there's zipper leaders that we get from Bernina um, and we put them on the handy quilter. So I have zipper leaders that we use as well that really do a good job because that allows you to go in and you can, you can just zip on and off a new, a new top. So you just get it all prepped onto um, a little, I'll show you. So your leader over here would have one end of the zipper. And then this little guy here is another end of the zipper. So you can go ahead and pin onto this. And then you just come up to your frame with it all pins and you zip it right onto the other side. Yeah, I, I have so some we, zipper leaders. I need to learn how to actually put them on the machine itself or on the, the frame of themselves. Yeah, so you can put them on the same way as your other leader. So you can use the Velcro because you have Velcro on yours right now, right? Right. 
So you can take the Velcro and you can get a, a Velcro strip because you can leave the same Velcro that's on here. Mm -hmm. And you can just take Vel This is what I would suggest because it's different depending on what you do. Like on Bernina, they use um, like a carpet tape that's double-sided to hook them on. But where you have the Velcro, you could simply just take uh, the other side of the Velcro. So you can purchase uh, Velcro in that length, mm -hmm. stitch it onto that. And then it just goes on the same way as what you already have. And then what do you do to stitch the, because mine doesn't have the zippers attached to the leaders themselves. How do you stitch that so you know it's straight to help create your straight what? edge for the... So tell me what you mean. Yours doesn't have the zippers attached to the leaders. So you, yeah, I've got so leaders and then long zippers, but they're not sewn onto the zippers aren't sewn onto anything, including the leader. Okay. So that's different. So you're going to create a zippered leader. Yeah. Even though it came in a kit as a zipper leader, I think the zippers are just freestanding and I have to attach them myself. And I'm so my, don't want to just use it on a regular machine because I'm afraid it may not be squared. Yeah. My suggestion is what you could do if you want to send me like the instructions that they've given with yours, because they probably have some instructions in there. I would yeah, it's the Bernina it. and it's like one page and it's pretty pathetic. <laughs> well, the Bernina, the, 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 the zipper is attached. I'll have to pull it apart. I haven't really looked at it because I've yeah, just the Bernina, the, the zippers are already attached. You don't have to do anything with it. Okay. So, so then it's just do... stitching the other or basting the other on straight. Well, stitching, I would go in and stitch. Uh, I would, I would, depending on what you're going to do, I would take maybe the Velcro because you already have Velcro on your frame. Uh huh. And again, you'd have to buy just a strip of, of the other side of the Velcro. Uh -huh. So, and then go in and stitch that onto the Bernina leader, the opposite of the zipper. Okay. Because the zipper is going to be coming out to the front right here. Okay. And then so, you make, just make sure your quilt itself, the quilt backing is really square so that you can baste that other zipper onto it, correct? So what you're going to do is, yes. So you may want you, you may want to, here's what I would do. I would, I wouldn't, I would take, I would run it the exact same way. So I would take my zipper leader, okay? Mm -hmm. And pretend there's not a zipper there just okay. for a minute. Mm -hmm. put it on there, have the zipper side attached. So it's attached to it. So okay. it's, it's, it's both pieces, the leader coming in and the zipper there. It's already zipped on. Got it. So pretend now that it's just like this. Okay. You pin it all together and it's pinned on there. And now it's, you're, you're squaring it up the exact same way that I do. And that's how I do it on a zipper leader. And then if I want to take it off, it's already done. I can just unzip it and zip it and unzip it because it's already squared onto there. Does that help? So that, yeah. So that's actually more for the convenience of move, removing a quilt on and off. Not, yes. it's not necessarily designed to save lots of time on getting a quilt on otherwise. No, no. Okay. Um, nope. I, I have the zipper leaders on uh -huh. and I took, and I just sewed mine right onto the leaders that were already on the machine. Um, and I, you stitched well, them directly do. onto your. I stitched them directly yeah. on. I just took them off the vel the velcro, you there know, you go. pulled apart, sewed it on, and then one of the things that helped me the most is that I labeled which side the fabric um, uh, pins to the zipper, and that way I can take um, and pin it on while watching TV or something. I don't have to have it close to my machine. It's really yeah. great. If you have a bad back or back bad knees, so you don't have to reach all the way over to um, pin your um, back on on that back take up bar, it really Absolutely. helps. And it already comes. The Bernina already comes with it already sewed together. So okay. you you just look in your box and you'll see that it's already sewed together. So you don't have to attach it. What you're probably seeing is the extra zippers. That yeah, okay, that could be because I. Yeah, haven't dealt with it at all. Yeah, and I, is, I don't know that you have time today, but is it possible to maybe spend five, ten minutes in a future week talking more about taking off a quilt that's partially done? Because that actually scares the bejeebies out of me. Yeah, we'll see how far we get with all that. Just depends on how, because uh, that could be something we do individually. Okay, just depending on how far we get with all of this. Right. There's there they're yeah. also on the Bernina ones. They are also labeled like they'll say back and top. Right. So like that's right. the extra piece. Yeah. So. I have seen that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>
Yeah, right where that says back and top, I write pin fabric to this side or pin it to yeah. the other side because yeah, I so would you- get, get confused. And I had my daughter-in-law buy her own set of lipper, of zippers. Super and so smart. that way we can switch back and forth all the time. Um, if she has a quilt she wants to come over and do, she puts it on the zippers. I take mine off. She puts it on. It's just, um, it hasn't messed up the quilts or anything. It's just, it's been really convenient for my situation. That's fantastic. Yeah. So batting, um, there's lots of different batting. And so I think this one's possibly put on wrong the first time, but we're going to go with it. So um, some batting is needle punched. So you're going to see, and you guys can't see it very well on there, but there's one side where the needles have pushed that fabric through. See, this side's a lot smooth. This, this side's fairly smooth. That's the top side. That's where the needles went into the batting. This is, so they're felted into there. This is the back side. If you happen to put this face up in the wrong direction, then you can get what they call bearding. So that's where your, your batting starts to poke up through your fabric on the other side. So you always wanna take like, uh, this is like a warm and natural or whatnot. And you wanna make sure that your batting, that the, the, the way that the needle punching was done, that your needle is gonna go through the same way, okay? I always so have just... to make up sayings so I remember things. So I always say dimples down. For yeah. that, so that, Good. yeah, so yeah. that you can remember which way it goes. The dimples go down. Dimples down. That's, I'll have to put that in my, my vocabulary. So I've got a real raggedy piece here, but we're going to go with it. So we're going to take our batting and we're going to lay it up here. And so the next thing that we're actually going to do, and this one, this batting is not great, but... Rather than put you guys on hold while I go and switch something out, we're gonna we're gonna do it now. Some of you have Pro Stitcher, some of you don't have Pro Stitcher. If you don't have Pro Stitcher, um, Pro Stitcher is the automated system. Then what you may want to invest in is channel locks. So channel locks, you guys, are yeah. This one just feels not right. Channel locks. Um, will go in and you can put them, you can connect them to your, on your wheel um, of your carriage to lock it in place into one spot. Um, if you have Pro Stitcher, which some of you have that and you'll be sticking around with me a little bit longer to go through the other classes, um, on your Pro Stitcher, there's a feature that you can turn on that does the horizontal or the vertical channel lock on there. So we're going to take how this thing is beat. So we're going to take you guys, and the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go in. So this would be underneath here. And then my other, which is my top, which I put on the floor here earlier to get it out of the wood so you guys could see, actually, is going to get put back into place where it was. So on a standard frame, this is how the top is going to go on. So I took my batting. I have my backing first. So backing first. My batting went all the way up and all the way to the take up bar. The next thing that we did is I took my batting and I laid it on top of the backing, dimple side down, right? So dimples down. The backing went on to the top of, or sorry, the batting sits on top of the backing. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take, which is our top which is right here. And we would bring it up and we're gonna match. And it actually, no surprise, you guys can't see it, but here's the center. And here is the center mark on my leader. So they match perfectly. So after all of that, everything is matching exactly how we expected it to be. But, and that's all I needed to find out because I'm actually not gonna pin this to here. But I use that to find out to see exactly if we're going to be centered and square. Um, that's one reason that we we do float. A lot of ours is because if you float your fabric, your top, that means you're not actually hooking it onto a bar. So your top is like your batting. See how my batting is just free flowing? 
And I'll talk to you guys another in, in uh, another class about the uh, handy hammock. But the handy hammock is is awesome. You can hook it underneath. It's actually right here. So you can hook it. It hooks underneath your uh, it hooks on your your um, bars on here, but it goes underneath and it's a hammock that all of your batting and everything can just sit on, especially if you're floating your top fabric. It's great as well. Excuse me on there. So if I was floating my fabric, that means because it's not connected to anything, I can constantly make adjustments to my top fabric if need be. So that's where we find that to be pretty useful. So we'll, we'll show that and talk about that just uh, in another little session. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take and I'm going to on the uh, Moxie. So, so far, again, you guys, everything is, everything that we've done is, is, is just technique. So I'm going to hold this on here. So if I wanted to do, and this is the same on any of the machines, if you have channel locks, you don't necessarily need this. So I'm going to show you over here on here. I've moved the fabric out of the way. So you see that little wheel right there? If I wanted to do a vertical channel lock, that means I don't want the machine to go front like this, front and back. So I want to lock it. That way I can do one straight line horizontally. I can get a channel lock to do that. So I'm going to grab one and show you how those work. So give me one second here. They're, they're pretty simple idea. And they come in packs of two. And so we're almost done here. I know that we're bumping up against our time slot, but so we're gonna take this little guy here and then all we're gonna do is open it up and put it over the top of that, that little wheel on there. And that's it. So now if I try to move it front to back, I could force it, but it's just gonna stay in one spot. So now if I was going to quilt, for instance, on here, right, on this quilt, what's going to happen is the machine is going to just stay on one straight line as I go from left to right or right to left. It's not going to move forward or back, all right? So channel locks are are pretty big deal. Um, they're not that expensive either. So, and again, it comes with two because you could also do a horizontal channel lock. So horizontal means you don't want the machine to be moving left and right. You want to you want to just do a vertical channel. You can still move it when you put those little channel locks on, guys. It's not so uh, locked in that you can't move at all. You still can. So some people use channel locks, and they'll work against them a little bit to do piano like the piano keys on there. It's pretty. It's 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 pretty simple. So I'm going to go onto the machine. And I'm not going to do too much of explaining on, on channel locks and engaging, disengaging. I'll show you a couple things on here, but give me a minute. And... I'm dragging something. I think I put a bunch of accessories on the back of that table, and now I got to go back there and get them off before we go too far. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's got it. Okay. So that's channel locks on, uh, on that machine. Now, if I had channel locks on, if I have the pro stitcher, we might go a little over our allotted time, but not much. I'll try to get this through. So all we need to do, all we're doing is getting the frame on this or the fabric onto the frame. There's another method which I'll I'll go into more details next week on. That's not a good view. Let's try over here because we're getting a little bit of sun action. Okay, 
So I know there's a little bit of a glare, but this will at least give us an idea. So as we go in, um, this is the Pro Stitcher menu. Let me see, I'm trying to get rid of some of the glare that just came in through the window. It's still there, but um, what we can do is we can go in and we can go into our, you can turn your gears, for instance, on and off, but I want to have them on. When we're in the Pro Stitcher, if I go into the quilt mode, so where I'm in quilt, and I set my machine where I want it to be, meaning on here, I set it where I want it to, to be locked in. If I were to lock it right now, what's going to happen is up on top, there's a spot that says channel lock. So right here, it says channel lock. So I'm going to engage the channel lock. And then it's saying, which one do you want? Horizontal or vertical? Okay. So if I do a horizontal, then what's going to happen is I can move my machine. It's locked in. So I can move it left to right. But I can't really physically move it front to back. It's locked in. Sorry. I'm like not paying attention over here. So right now I can move my machine, you guys, on here, it'll move left to right. But if, even if I try to pull it front to back, I could force it and you'd hear, you'd hear it going, you'd hear it slapping against the gears. The gears would be hitting against that blue track on there. So now that I have a channel lock engaged on there, what I can do is run a plumb line or a line across so from the center out, next week we'll get into adjusting because this is one thing you can do on, on your Amaras and your uh, Forte. Your handlebars can be adjusted. On the, on the Moxie, they can't be adjusted. But now I could go in and I could do a stitch that just goes um, across here. And then I'll teach you guys next week also how to do tie-ins and tie-offs and all the other cool features. Okay. But right now, I'm just drawing up my thread, and I'm going to clip that. And I'm going to use my scissors. Where did I put them? So the Amara and the Forte, I'm going to put these scissors on there because last... They actually have on the machine itself. You guys, this is really cool. There's a magnet right here. So the Amara and the Forte, you can just throw your scissors onto that, which I didn't do, which would make more sense. So anyway, I would do that line. And I usually go centers out, just like I did when I... Uh, when I pinned... And then lastly, pull that over. And so now on here, and I didn't use the basting stitch, I would clip off probably all this other batting because now it's just extra bulk. So if you look in here, all this other batting, you can see that stitch line. So now I've got a stitch line down in there and it goes all the way across. So it's a little hard to see on the angle. I'd get rid of some of that batting that's up on top. So I'd cut that out, but you can see that line that's in there. So you guys see that right there, that stitch line? So those, that's thread. So now what I would do is I would take my top and it's my center is still marked there. And what I would do is loosen up the sides so I could grab my top 
and I'm just going to take my top and I'm going to line it up to the line that goes straight across here. Now, two more things and then I'll, I know you guys are probably ready to go. You gave me most of your day. Um, so what I do is I would get those line, those tops lined up. So let me do that real quick. And not everybody does this next thing, but I'm going to tell you that it's what we suggest. And then you're going to decide to do whatever you want to do because it's your machine and it's your quilts and all those fun things. But what we suggest that you do is once you've lined that up with that up on top, instead of just going in, you guys, and going onto your basting stitch and basting it right onto there, what we suggest is you pin this down and it can be really wide, widespread pins across here. Okay, and then pin it across that way, then use your basting stitch and stitch it across here. What I'll do is I'll try, I'm gonna leave this in this position um, and then I can show you guys next week the remainder of that. That way you guys don't aren't getting held after class. But we'll get that squared away. Um, and then what I like to do also, the last finishing part is I would base down the sides. So over here even, I would base down the sides of, on there to keep that locked in with the basting stitch. So next week, same time, um, you can use the same link. I'll send out a reminder, but if you can't find the reminder or you don't get it, you can just use the exact same link to come into the class, same email. And what we'll do is we'll start getting into settings in your machine, basting stitches, length, um, on the Amara and the Forte, they have a really cool feature that is a bobbin recording feature to tell you how long, how much thread you have on your bobbin. So it's an estimator is what it is. So we'll teach you how to use that because most people have it and they have no clue what they're doing with it. So we'll go in and we'll teach you how to use that. Talk about lasers. Um, yeah. And we'll, we'll keep this party going. All right. Thank you guys. Hopefully this helps. We'll get uh, the recording. I'll have that. It usually takes a couple of days, probably be first of the next week before that, that recording gets published. So once I get all that taken care of, I'll publish, I'll send out, I'll probably send out the, the reminder and the, the link at the same time on there. But if you guys have individual questions, let me know and we'll get you taken care of. Thank you. 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 Thank you.